Hi guys, welcome back. I am Red Z, and welcome back to RIS Weekends, where we are covering all the big news up to the release of version 0.6 in October. And today I have another very special guest. We've got Mausolos, one of the lead historians for the mod. Welcome to the video, Mausolos. Yeah, it's an honor to be here. Thanks, Red Z. Um, well, great to be back, actually. Uh, I think I've been here before, haven't I? <laughs> yeah, well, we're, um, yeah. We've, chat we've chatted a bit in the past and you've done a few interviews before, so uh, it's good to be back exactly. on the old YouTube platform, definitely. Um, and you do know so much about all of this history. In case you guys out there don't know, a lot of the historical notes, when I say a lot, pretty much every single historical note that you will have seen on my uh, on my videos, on the rosters, has come from Mausolos, and on the map, on the on a lot of the stuff, it's all come from him. So thank you to him for that, and it clearly knows so much about this time period. But today, we are going to be going through all the minor factions of the Greeks, why they've been added, what their unique units are, where they are, and what they're doing on the map, why we've decided to add them into the map. If you want to check out my Greek AOR unit video, that's in the description, or the map showcase that was last week. A couple of videos on that. So if you've not seen the full map yet, go and check that out. But today we're focusing on a deep dive on each of these small factions. So, Mausolos, to start with, um, how many Greek factions are there? How many Greek minor factions, unplayable factions are there currently? So we've added, uh, I think, 25 or 26. Well, yeah, not, like, not even I'm sure right now. We added quite a few new factions. Um, I think it's 25. Might be 29 um, now and the after the last couple being added. But that I don't know whether that includes like uh, sort of Heleno-Thracians as well, but I'm not sure. Yeah, it may include some of the Thracian factions. I think there's 25 or 26 of these unplayable ones, but whatever. You can count by watching this video. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> because we'll go through them one by one and then find out how many there are. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we've, we've chosen them to um, cover the whole map, basically, wherever Greek civilization left an imprint. Um, you will now find a Greek faction um, unplayable um, or playable. Of course, there are already playable ones. Um, but we do think that all these unplayable factions will, of course, add a lot to the campaign and make it more intriguing than just to interact with rebels. Yeah, so is that is that the main reason why you've added all these smaller, sort of minor Greek city-states into uh, into the game? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they make it much more interesting um, to actually play the campaign from the point of view of uh, both diplomacy and conquering, um, because you can interact with them in various ways. They also have their own agents, of course. They make the map more um, diverse, of course, they have the different banners and colors and everything is um, just much more detailed basically than before when it's just grey rebels everywhere and of course we're aiming to to um, add loads of factions eventually for, for all the different cultures, um, yeah. but this um, update is on the Greek cultures, on the Greek factions um, 0 0.6 and of course it's the first major update. Um, which uh, I guess makes sense because the mod is after all about the third to first century BC or first century AD, which is the Hellenistic period, yeah. um, named after our dear Greeks, <laughs> who spread <laughs> their culture everywhere. And of course, we also focus on the Greeks first because um, many players, of course, like to play as Greek factions, be they the traditional ones like Athens or Sparta, which we're seeing on the map right now. Yeah. Um, or the Hellenistic kingdoms, um, the Antigonids and Macedon, but also the Ptolemies down in Egypt and in Asia Minor, or the Seleucids in Asia. And yeah, everyone can have their pick now, and you will also face loads of other Greek factions in yeah. the campaign. And I think I mentioned it last week on the video with uh, Jorilaf about all these sort of basically Greece now is just a massive battle royale, and it's so fun to play. Uh, I've obviously <laughs> had my hands on the base for quite a while, and playing in this region now is just super, super fun. It's it's difficult in some cases, depending on who you're playing. But of course, it's meant to be. It's it's basically <laughs> all out war from the start. And at the end of the day, what's the game called? It's called Total War. And I think you've achieved that with all these little factions um, dotted around the map. So uh, yeah, 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 yeah. 
So I think what we're going to do now is we're going to go through every single one of these little factions, guys, and talk about their history a little bit, why they've been added into the mod, why they were significant, and maybe a little bit about their unique units, although... Uh, we've already talked about that. There are some videos on that already. But we'll start. We're going to go west to east. So we're going to start with the Western Mediterranean Greeks to start with. And we're going to start with Emporion. So, Mauslos, do you want to explain uh, a little bit about Emporion and why it's been added into uh, into the mod? And you can see them on the screen right now. Yeah, so before I uh, speak about Emporion specifically, I think it's important to note how we chose the factions. I think there were three main factors. Um, the first is the geographical position on the map, because obviously you want to have more factions in corners which do not have that many factions already. And on other parts of the map where you already have many factions, we may have left one or two candidates out. Yeah. But of course, the second second factor we um, we factored in. <laughs> so, well, you get it, <laughs> yeah, what I mean. Exactly. Um, is um, the historical um, significance, especially in this period, because of course there are also other Greek cities and factions which may have been very significant but lost their significance in the Hellenistic period. Mm. Thus, after 270 BC, when our campaign starts, they, well, they didn't do much, as our faction leader <laughs> <Yeah>. likes to say. <laughs> so um, they may not have been included. And then third of the third factor would be how unique can the faction be in that, of course, um, is more than just their position it's also what kind of persons do they have um what units could they have and as yeah. we can see these two characters there right now um pythagoras of emporion and yeah. um what was the other one in in road the smaller Agathon, type of please. yeah Agathon. yeah we, we we also based these i mean some of these are historical characters which actually existed and are known from for instance the histories of polybius who describes the third second century bc or they are recorded in inscriptions or on coins. Um, others are, if we do, do not have much historical evidence for 270 BC or around that year, it's just names popular in that region. And that is true from Porion. Yeah. So Porion was basically chosen um, mostly for, for its location, obviously, because it's the only Greek faction we have on the Iberian Peninsula, even though in its location in modern day Apurias, and I apologize to all Spanish watchers <laughs> butchering the pronunciation. Uh, Don't worry. Catalonia I'm going just... to be butchering a lot of Greek pronunciation. So sorry to all you ancient Greek stands by, and yeah, you mouse yeah, as well, but it's all right. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, I don't think people are going to uh, write letters to complain. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, it's a modern name, Ampurias in and Catalonia. And um, of course, it's, it's on the edge of the Iberian Peninsula. It's not very deep in. But if you go down the coast, uh, near modern-day Valencia, you would find Hemeroscopeion and Akaloike, two other Greek settlements which were somewhat connected. Yeah, we, you can see Hemeroscopeion there because it's yeah. owned by the Greek city-states faction, which we also brought back so that the remaining rebel Greek cities can be differentiated. Akaloike is just to the west of it, modern Alicante, and um, which many holiday goers will probably know. Yeah, and Akaloike. Alicante, it is uh, given to the rebels so that, um, yeah, the remaining Greek rebel cities are split up. So we have the Greek city states faction as a super faction as it used to be. And then, uh, yeah, Akraloike is given to the rebels. So, yeah, they won't always group their troops together because the rebels like yeah. to do that. Only if it makes sense if they're in an alliance. So, Emporion, um, the name Emporion is actually means trade port, and it was a mm. very common form of Greek settlement. Emporii, as the plural is, um, was spread all over the Mediterranean, and often a settlement like Massalia next to Emporion developed out of an initial. Um, uh, yeah, that the, there was initially an Emporion there in Massalia, for instance, and it later developed to Apollo's city-state. Yeah, and. Uh, Massalia was founded by the Phocaeans from Western Asia Minor, flat, who fled from the Persians in the mid 6th century BC. Mm. And Emporion was also um, founded in this context, either from Phocaea itself or from the Massalios from Massalia. And um, its history um, is, of course, very important as a trade settlement in Iberia. And, of course, Greek goods from Greece were exported all the way here. 
it was not really a political power, we have to say, but Masali yeah. has a bit of a fan favorite for many, <laughs> and many asked us to add Emporion, so um, we did that as well. They have one unit which you're going to show, the Emporionite Hoplites, based on a depiction we had. Um, but yeah, and the, uh, otherwise we don't know too much about the military. As you can see, the unit description is still missing. Well, we're going to get to that. Yeah, It has a nice golden shining shield, as we found on the, on the depiction from Emporium from this time period. And this one has the hat of Medusa. Um, Are you sure that's so, yeah, not Shia um, LaBeouf? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I haven't, I haven't seen him since Indiana Jones before. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> He's a he's a vampire yeah. that's been living for thousands of years apparently, and uh, yeah. this was the first depiction really? ever ever found of him on the uh, Emporianite <laughs> Hoplites. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I mean that's pretty much what we can say on Emporion. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was going to be good for everyone who plays in the Beria to have a Greek faction there, and of course it can connect with Massalia and it starts ally to Massalia as oh, well, cool. I think, which makes sense. Yeah, yeah. fantastic. So let's move on slightly east down to Sicily, to Akragas. So no longer is Syracuse alone as the Greeks on Sicily. Akragas is yeah. here now as well, which is pretty cool. Bordering Carthage, which for them is probably quite scary, but uh, <laughs> they're down here on Sicily. So in terms of the, uh, you know, why they've been added and, and their significance, do you want to just talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, as you can see, Akragas uh, has a crap, which is from one of its coins as the faction symbol. Yeah. This and the fact that it's probably in one of the most challenging positions of the whole campaign mm. has already made um, the beta testers who were allowed to actually play it. And of course, some people will figure out how to unlock them anyway, and play with factions. Yeah. Um, yeah, has made it a bit of a favorite with some of the testers because it's just so, so damn and difficult with Carthage on the west, <laughs> on the east, and the Romans about to arrive. Um, it quickly rose to fame in the 6th century BC, not long after its foundation, Akragas, as the home of the tyrant Phalaris, who, okay. among other things, invented the torture instrument known as the Brazen Bull. And okay. then later, it was under other tyrants, Bostateron and his family in the 5th century were allies of Syracuse, and together with them defeated the Carthaginians at Himera in 480 BC on the northern end of the island. <laughs> And it was a great island, uh, a great fortress, but at 406 BC, um, it was besieged by the Carthaginians who wanted revenge for 480. <laughs> and after a year-long siege, it fell in 405 and was sacked, oh, and then okay. suffered much um, afterwards. And in 270 BC, Akragas is populated once again, but it now inclines towards Carthage, and it would be taken by both sides during the First Punic War. Mm. So um, that goes to show <laughs> what a difficult position it is in. But people who visited Sicily will remember the great temples at Agrigento, modern Akragas. In Latin, it's Agrigentum, as you can also see on the map. And the yeah. Valley of Temples there is famous. So um, yeah, it was, it was a big city and it's famous for its tyrants. So yeah. why not add it? So because the position is just crazy. Yeah, uh, I think you you like you have completed being a tyrant if you're known for having a torture instrument made for you i mean yeah. <laughs> that is yeah. that is dictator 101 like <laughs> what the hell <laughs> that's crazy uh but anyway uh yeah acragas a uh, pretty cool nation right down here on the su south of sicily like you've said it's going to be very very difficult uh, and like i say about the unplayable nations i said it last week guys i'm going to do a video showing you how to unlock all these unplayable nations in the files the reason why they're not just playable is because you know not a load of, uh you know they haven't been added the unique flavors all the other nations and they're tiny little states they're not you know really significant states like the antigonids or epirus or something like that um and it would just clutter the whole <laughs> the whole of the uh, campaign starting screen if there were you know 50 of these tiny small states there but i will show you how to make them playable so if you do want to play as Akragas, basically doing a ryuku world conquest equivalent from eu4 to uh, this game then you can do and uh, i will show you how but yeah cool so with Akragas, they have a couple of uh, 
a couple of unique units, the Sisel Peltophori, the Sisel Theroporoi, and the Peloponnesian yeah. Hoplites as well. Uh, and we've actually shown all those before in uh, in the Syracuse roster, I believe, apart from the Peloponnesian Hoplites. Uh, but yeah, they've got a few unique units. So next one is actually an emergent faction, guys. It is Taras, which is pretty much Tarentum, isn't it? Uh, it's an emergent faction, and it's pretty famous, to be honest. Uh, so do you want to talk about Tarentum a little bit, Miles Lawson, and, and the history of Tarentum? Yeah, as you already said, Taras in Greek is Tarentum, and Latin Taranto in modern Italian. Um, I don't think, um, yeah, it needs much of an introduction. As you said, it was one of the major um, Greek cities in Magna Grecia, or Magna Grecia, as the Italians say, um, the Greeks in the West. And there it is um, one of the most powerful cities, especially in the 4th century BC, when it was the leader of the Italian League. Mm. But after that, it had much trouble with its neighbors, um, the different peoples of the region, the Apigians, the Mesopians, the Semnites, the Lucians, and Brutians. Mm -hmm. And of course, for several times, they called Sparta and Epirus for help. For help. Um, also Syracuse in 298 BC, helped them against the barbarians. Yeah. Um, and, and they had a friendship treaty with Rome. Um, but in 282 BC, the Romans betrayed the friendship treaty, and then <laughs> famously, Pyrrhus of Epirus was called to Italy to fight for the Tarentines and fight for them. He did, but eventually he found that Sicily was more interesting, and then we returned, <laughs> and he just couldn't make up his mind what to do, and then he went back to Greece, and he left the Tarentines alone, and they fell under Roman rule in 272 BC. Well, that's only two years before our campaign starts, so there's a possibility here for... Um, independence yet again and of course the famous tarentine cavalry which became the name for yeah kind of um skirmisher mercenary cavalry all around the greek world um originated from here and um Pyrrhus also armed the locals as phalangites as the so-called um Leucaspides, the white shields yeah which are subsumed in the upper road rosta under the deutsche roy the second ones so to say uh, which I think is a name from from other mods as well. Um, so the Tarentines will have these these unique units. Um, if they do spawn, or if you play them eventually, um, during the Second Punic War, they did actually go over to Hannibal and held out four years. Um, and there was a lot of conflict oh, and bad. sacking of the city again, and they resisted the Romans for quite a while. But um, yeah, eventually it was actually a nice holiday home for Horace, the Roman poet in the Imperial period. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, a pretty, so that's pretty, our history. Yeah, it's a pretty famous, when? famous place. If you know much about Pyrrhus, like like you said, Val's lost, like if, if anyone at home yeah. uh, is interested in Pyrrhus quite a bit, then uh, Tarentum's kind of the, uh, the start of it all, really, <laughs> uh, yeah. for the middle part of Pyrrhus and the end of his life, really. So... Uh, yeah, very interesting and interesting place. Uh, but I think in this region as well, people can AOR recruit the Italiote Hoplites and the Italiote Epibarti. Now, we're not going to reveal what the exact yeah. method of AOR recruitment is going to be, guys, uh, just because um, it's not fully implemented yet and there's still debates going on. But there will be a video, as I keep saying on this sort of stuff. There is a video coming up about this stuff, so uh, there's lots of videos coming up on the updates, guys, so make sure you do subscribe, make sure you do like these videos, because like we say, it's RAS weekends, every weekend leading up to release, we're going to have two videos on different stuff on the mod, deep dives like this, and I think they, um, it's really good to get this uh, perspective from the mod team as well. Uh, but let's go up to Ancon next, which is over here, isn't it? Ancon. Um, which is not a faction, but there are a couple of units, just to uh, just to let you all know. We've got the Anconitan Archers and the Anconitan Hoplites. I know I've butchered the pronunciation of that, uh, but you can get some special AOR Greek units in there as well. Um, so I think that's everything from the Western Mediterranean. So should we move across to mainland Greece, potentially? Oh, I think we... Should not forget about Issa. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, we, we'll count Issa as part of Greece, even though it's not. <laughs> right. So, yeah, we'll go <laughs> to really. <laughs> we'll go to Issa first, even though it's not part of Greece. But <laughs> we're we're, we're uh, kind of I don't know northeastern Mediterranean now, so <laughs> we've counted as part of mainland Greece anyway, even though it's not. 
But we'll start on the uh, sort of uh, the Greek uh, mainland, which is down here, but the, the Greek mainland-ish uh, of Issa, which is up here. So, uh, yeah, let us know about Issa. Yeah, I mean, um, we are now in the area where Dionysius the first uh, of Syracuse was really active in the first half of the fourth century BC, when Syracuse was the most powerful um, entity in, in in all of Europe potentially, just before Philip the second of Macedon mm. would um, send the throne over there. But Dionysius the first of Syracuse, who reigned from 405 to 367 BC. And not only was he involved with the history of Akragas and Taras, but he was also involved with the history of Ancon, because he founded it, and he also founded Issa. And we've just seen Ancon, modern Icona, which was founded as a Syracusan military base, as a naval base on the western coast of the Adria, mm. Adriatic Sea, while Issa would cover the eastern coast. A victory of cool. the Illyrians here opened these islands, and the modern island of Vish, I think it is, where, again, my Croatian pronunciation is not that, <laughs> not, <laughs> not top-notch, I guess. Um, they established a colony here called Issa, which we can see on the screen right now. And it, it's also um, found as sub-colonies like Salona, modern-day Split, um, also Kokura Melina, the, the Black Corfu, um, on one of the other islands, which are uh, Croatian name, which I cannot recall right now. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, um, it was all here so the Syracusans could control the Adriatic, because at the time Dionysius controlled most of Sicily and also had defeated the Italiot League, which you already mentioned. Uh, we have units for all the Greek cities in southern Italy because they were in the Italiot League. That was the name of the Greeks in, in, in southern Italy, Italiots. Mm -hmm. And um, they get their own units as well. Later, they were allies of the Romans, but in the fourth century, they were defeated by Syracuse. And then the Syracusans also wanted to control the Adriatic and set up Issa and also Ancon. Um, so, all of this is the product of Dionysius. Syracuse doing and then the Isaians afterwards they built up a small maritime empire as you can see here of their own yeah. they controlled the trade between Epirus the Dalmatian hinterland and Italy and um, because of the alliance between here Hiero the second of Syracuse um, and the Romans from 264 to the death of Hiero in 215 BC Issa also became a bit of a friend of Rome and the Romans would intervene in the East for the first time in 229, 228 BC to support the Isaians who were besieged by Tuta, the Queen of Illyria. Cool. And then there's different versions about the story, but Tuta somehow had one of the envoys from Rome killed and was one of the Isaian envoys. And then the Romans actually dispatched an army of 20,000 men infantry and 2,000 man cavalry and 200 ships which was the first time that the Romans crossed the sea wow. and go to the east. So these signs played a big role here, and later they were still regarded as an important maritime power and a naval ally of the Romans. So this is why they're in the mot. And um, yeah, they also have two special units, I think, the Isaian Hoplites and the yep. Isaian Epibati with the Marines, which um, pays homage to their position as a naval power. Both are rather lightly armed, which has already disappointed some testers. But to be fair, um, <laughs> the Illyrians are not recorded as using body armor in this period. So why would these signs need <laughs> yeah. any body armor themselves? They will, of course, still get some heavier units as other yeah. factions do. So a pretty cool, uh, pretty cool little faction, to be fair. Nice, uh, nice position. Uh, interesting history. Mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of the Epibati, then, what does that mean? In general, does that just mean marines uh, in terms of uh, in, in Greek, or is there a more deeper meaning to it? Yeah, it basically means means marines. I think a standard triary or triare, trireme or whatever you want to call it. Um, the the average Greek battleship had, I think, one hundred and seventy men of sailors, officers, rowers and on board and about 12 to 18 soldiers and these are the epibatai and they yeah. could fight um, with bows, with slings, with swords, spears, basically everything. Of course their armor would always be rather light because you know if you go overboard <laughs> you're burying a heavy bronx muscle cuirass <laughs> then that's not gonna end up for you. <laughs> I've got the coolest helmet on board! Oh shit! <laughs> yeah, exactly. As soon as you fall into the sea. 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, and that happens quite often, you can imagine, like not just in battle, but also because ships might be damaged. And there yeah. might always be issues where people go overboard, just like the pirates and us rigs, you gotta get used to it. Yeah. <laughs> Nice. So, really cool little nation. Um, so, we'll move down the coast slightly, down to here, and we are going to talk a little bit about the Akarnanian League as well, which is a little league, got a couple of settlements in here. So, what did these guys get up to historically? So, the Akarnanian League is one of the really minor factions in mainland Greece at first look. It plays an important role, as you can see right now, between the Aetolians in yellow on the in the east and the Epirotes in green in the north. And um, rather unsurprisingly, um, the country was divided between the two in the 250s BC, mm. so not very long after the start of our campaign. Even though the Aetolians had signed an alliance in um, <laughs> 263 BC with them, which in a claw included a clause saying that it was an alliance forever, <laughs> but it only took about five years for the Etolians to say, "Oh no, we'd rather go have these lands ourselves." So oh they just God. went in an accident. Literally, yeah. <laughs> literally, this time period was like, "I'm your ally," and then two minutes later, "Oh shit, no, something's happened." No, I'm not. I'm your enemy now. I'm your ally over this side. No, I'm their ally. I said they, I was their ally five years ago. I promise. It's just like, yeah, oh, yeah, it's just yeah. crazy. <laughs> That's exactly how it is, so people shouldn't complain about the AI and its diplomacy, really. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, in 230 BC, then, um, the dynasty of Puros and Epirus was actually overthrown, and the Epirate Koinon was installed, a kind of re aristocratic republic. And this gave the Akananians the chance to regain the independence in the same year and refound the league. But 12 years later, the Aetolians, uh, sorry, 18 years later, the Aetolians had the glorious idea to invite the Romans. <laughs> and of course, the new coalition would overrun the poor Acarnanians. Yeah. In 167 BC, after Mac Macedon was put to the death, well, the sword, well, <laughs> kind of, at least the kings were, the Romans re-erected um, the Akananian League, but it didn't play much of a role afterwards. Mm. It's it's mainly there because um, yeah, it's in a very interesting position, it's in a challenging position, and it produced hoplites and slingers, and especially during the Peloponnesian War when the Athenians tried to conquer Akanania, the slingers really acquired much fame as some of the best slingers in all of the Greek world because they defeated the Athenian hoplites. Oh, cool. And um, they also have their own hoplites who fought for Purus in Italy, Mm. for Taras. Um, so there's a connection once again with the factions we've already seen. Oh, fantastic. That's really cool as well. So um, let's move on to another emergent faction then, onto the Thessalian League, uh, which is an emergent faction over here in Thessaly. So I don't know exactly which settlement is the uh, the trigger or whether it's multiple settlements but like we said we're going to be so you know the uh, the emergent factions we're going to have another video i, I keep saying it and I'm, I'm i'm not being a power okay i'm not repeating myself too much but yeah there will be a video on the emergent factions coming up uh, and how they emerge and all that sort of thing um uh, but yeah they are an emergent faction in here and if you've seen my sparta campaign i have used many 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 of the unique units the thessalian lancers um uh, because the Spartan cavalry is terrible, and the Thessalian lancers are good. So, yeah. But they also have access to another unique unit, which is the per Perhyben cavalry. Do you want to pr <laughs> make my pronunciation a bit better on that? Oh, I have no idea how to pronounce them uh, if I'm speaking English. I mean, I'm struggling yeah, okay. to pronounce it. If it's in German, I <laughs> no idea. I mean, it's a strange word, even in Greek. So uh... yeah. It's, it's Perhyben cavalry. Perhyben? Perhyben cavalry? See, in English you want to say Perhyben cavalry and just make the H silent, but... Maybe, maybe, yeah. Yeah, per probably not. Perhyben, yeah, Perhyben or something like that. Perhyben cavalry, it there is. we are! <laughs> yeah, I mean, they also had a very specific accent, the Thessalian Oh, okay. Cool. <laughs> in any case, um, yeah, the Thessalian League, it fell under Macedonian control, as we can see here. And they had a so-called Targos as the hat of the league, which is basically at least Strategos, which is a more familiar word for most. 
um, listen to this video and the Tagos was responsible for the military leadership and the organization of the league mm. and it was basically ruled in personal union just like Poland and Lithuania in the early modern period for instance oh, cool. um, or at times Saxony in Poland mm. or Hanover in the UK of yep. course um, under the Hanoverian dynasty in the 18th century early 19th it's the same here the Macedonian king becomes the Tagos of the Thessalian League yeah. But of course, the Thessalians um, used to be an quite important independent power, even though they had different tyrants fighting against each other in the 4th century, which uh, was how they fell under the Macedonian yoke in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, they have a problem. They have a big problem here. If you see the bay on the right, which is Demetrias, um, founded there by Demetrius Polyoketis, the father of Antigonus Gonatas, the king of Macedon in 270 mm. BC. And. Um, Demetrias was called one of the fattest of Greece, together with Chalkis on Euboea and Corinth, because it was an unassailable fortress town controlling both the access to the sea and the land routes into the interior of Thessaly. Yeah. And um, the Thessalians revolted a few times, but um, they could never really take Demetrias, and I don't think the Romans staffed it out or defeated the Macedonians elsewhere. Yeah. So that's a bit of an issue for the Thessalians, but. Um, um, and this also undermined Pyrrho's plan to re-establish the Thessalian League because he wanted to do this. Um, but after the Second Roman-Macedonian War, it was reinstated. And then they, they kept complaining in Rome about the Macedonians trying to reenact them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but well, that, that's what happens. Um, yeah, in 27 BC, that's kind of the end of the story. The Tagos um, officer had been replaced by Strategos, like other Greek states. And in 27 BC, the, um, the Thessalians elected Augustus, the first Roman emperor, as their strategos. So even in Roman times, there was a bit of a personal union with Thessalians and um, a foreign power. But of course, in our campaign, the Thessalians have the chance to shape their own history once again. Yeah, of course. And uh, yeah. Hopefully they'll emerge and, uh, and be a thorn in the side of the Antigonids if you're playing any of the other smaller uh, smaller nations. But uh, I think that's mainland Greece yeah. done now, apart from the Black Sea, which we'll get to later. Well, not the Black Sea, the Sea of Marmara and stuff, but uh, around these islands. But we'll, uh, we'll move on to that later. So let's move on to the Peloponnese. And we'll start with Ellis. So let's start with Ellis on the western coast of the Peloponnese, right next to the statue of Zeus. Here he is, enjoying himself. Uh, but yeah, the uh, the uh, uh, why is Ellis then in the uh, in the mod? I think you've already shown us why. Basically, <laughs> they control the Olympic Games, they control Olympia, and that of course gave them a great source of, of income, of prestige, and everything else. Also, because they had to keep it open, um, even in war times, for other Greeks to participate in the in the Olympic Games. So it was a lot of um, responsibility, um, and they had to also annex some of the um, cities around them. Uh, Elis itself, as a city, was founded relatively late in the fifth century BC, but the landscape was already known as um, as Elis for a long time. Hmm. And we, you can see Leprion on the map, which is just below. Um, uh, Olympia, and well, now it's uh, to the right of, uh, of yeah, Olympia. <laughs> Leprion was. <laughs> no worries. Um, there was some precious alien. Uh, e what, what, how do you, however you say it in, in English? Uh, procession of Elis. Um, they lost it, however, in the 4th century, in the late 4th century, because they had become too ambitious and tried to conquer more territory and then ended mm. up losing most of what they already had. And in 245 BC, they would ally with the Aetolian League to reclaim Leprion. And that is kind of their role. They are a bit of an anti achaean power on the Peloponnese. And yeah. the aliens also had a bit of a mixed relationship with Sparta. And um, yeah, they reconquered Leprion together with the Aetolians. Then the Macedonians came back and took it once again. Later, it was forced to join the Achaean League after the Achaean League was destroyed. Um, yeah. It just went back and forth. Um, it was always an ambitious power. It had a very interesting um, institute, a very interesting institution. Not just the Olympic Games, but also the Ephibea, the um, institution for the training and the um, education of young men. In in Elis was quite famous in antiquity, and also um, the one for the girls actually, 
who also trained in the gymnasium at times, which was quite uncommon in the ancient world. So the aliens were basically all about all about um, sports and recreation yeah. and um, <laughs> all parts of society. Really. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So they have um, they have a couple of uh, unique units. They've got the alien uh, hoplites and they've got the alien Ephebes. But what does the Ephebes what does Ephebes mean then? Because you did uh, uh, mention the Ephebea slightly then as well. So what does that yeah. actually mean in terms of the units? Because there's a few units with Ephebes in the name. So we have to imagine that um, until the fourth century BC, there was basically no military training in the ancient world. Um, people did not prepare for warfare. They were levied mm. when it was needed. The nobles had the horses. Of course, there was no riding and hunting. That was basically all they did to prepare. And um, modern military historians of the ancient world, such as Rule Conine and Dyke, they, they really stressed this point that there was no training. There was no preparation. Yeah. And then, of course, the Macedonians came along in the 4th century BC and changed everything because Philip and Alexander <laughs> were so successful. Um, and they also had the sort of training system that the Athenians said, huh, the Ephebes, which were usually the young men between the age of 17 and 19 years old, even though some cities could be 15 to 17, sometimes it could also be 19 to 21 or yeah. whatever combination of these ages. Um, they should be trained, not just um, in general, like teaching them the language and some philosophical treatises, because of course the education was mainly open for people of uh, the sons of the of the uh, noble and richer citizens, and not everyone. But you could pay for the education of poorer boys, and that also became more common in the Hellenistic period. But out of the example of Athens, everyone now started to set up Ephebeas which is um, an institution for the training of the young men that mm. train in the gymnasium, um, the an op uh, like, yeah, an open stadium-like base, train there, um, train their buddies there, and at the same time be instructed in philosophy and uh, whatever, mathematics and all these kind of things. So they would also be instructed personally. So it's basically a um, gym with a library attached, is what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's basically a bit of a mix of that. Of course, they also learned about loads of other things, like their political participation, what they can then do, what kind of clothes do you have to wear. Um, they were also taught about laugh and all these kind of things, yeah. of course. And um, <laughs> It's important to note that the Ephebes, um in the military training, they were often stationed in the force that guarded the Shora, the territory of Apollos, city-state. So um, they would receive some military experience by guarding the territory against the incursions of the neighbors and that's why we usually represented them as as, as archers yeah because they often learned archery and javelin throwing sometimes horse riding they did not really train as hoplites which is quite interesting because mm. they would end up being hoplites <laughs> yeah. most of the time <laughs> but maybe it was an archaic maybe it was an archaic um tradition but it's also possible that they simply trained as archers because they had to defend the force and the countryside and they had to defend yeah the um the the the, the farm stats and all that and being mobile archers who can shoot from towers and fortresses against enemies both greeks and barbarians who make incursions into, t into your territory that is probably something that was very useful and helpful yeah I'm sorry for the uh, for the crude reduction of the uh, Ephebea <laughs> and, and well, gymnasium I'm, I'm, down I'm, to I'm, a gym with a library attached. I think that's I think that's going on my list of uh, terrible quotes. Um, <laughs> let, let's talk slightly about um, Megalopolis then, as another emergent faction that can come out of the Antigonids. Now I know there was beef with Sparta with them, but. Uh, exactly why they're uh, emergent here as well. Um, so what are we looking at with uh, Megalopolis, which is here on the map? Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. Megalopolis, which uh, basically means um, the, the big city, <laughs> the mega city, Megapolis, yeah. uh, comes from there. Um, I mean, the, the geographer Strabo makes a joke about it being uh, the Great Desert in the first century BC, mm. <laughs> because apparently it, it had a huge territory, but it didn't actually have... A population that big. <laughs> oh, um, it was created. It was created by the Boeotians, by the Thebans in the fourth century BC, um, against the Spartans. Where after the battles at Mantinea and Leuctra, when they had defeated the Spartiates, which most people will have probably know, heard about, 
in the 370s and 60s, they founded Megalopolis. And um, it was supposed to block Spartan advance north. And as you can see here in 270 BC, this was very much the case. And Megalopolis and yeah. also Argos, which is our next immersion faction. Yeah. And Argos is probably better known than, than Megalopolis, the home of Perseus, the hero, and of course the arch rival of Sparta throughout the archaic and classical period. Both cities were governed by tyrants who were loyal to the Antigonids at this point in time. But towards the third end of the third century BC, both tyrant families would, after the death of Antigonus Gonatas and or respectively his son, I mean, the, the, the starting Macedonian king, who was very successful, respected, and um, a skilled military commander after his death. Both cities um, seceded from Antigonid rule, and they would eventually decide to join the Achaean League, which um, had a very um, democratic <laughs> um, system, at least between the cities, and uh, promised the tyrants of each city that they, uh, upon joining, would become the strategos, the leader of the league, which is basically as if, um, to make an example uh, of today, if the UK would ask Ireland to join the UK and the current, um, what is it called, Taisoach, the president of Ireland, yeah. would then become the prime minister of the UK for the next, <laughs> for the next <laughs> period. So it's a very strange yeah, thing very that the Achaeans did. But, but it was successful. Um, yeah. It made it, it helped them to integrate both cities into the league, even though Argos would switch back and forth several times, which is also they have a good claim to be an independent faction here. And of course, Argos had a, had a famous history and um, both have special units as well, which are also yeah. important. The context of them joining the Achaean League, I think the Argives, as they're called, yeah. they have an Apilecto, a Hoplite unit. Yeah. The good old chosen Hoplites, um, uh, the, 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 the opposition to the Spartiates, basically. Mm. By Megalopolis uh, has a unit of phalangites, um, yeah. the first seen on the Peloponnese at all in 222 BC when the Antigonids armed the Megalopolitans with bronze shields so they could fight in the phalanx against the Spartans. And of nice. course, Megalopolis would become the home of Polybius, the, the historian of the second century BC, to whom we owe much of what we know about this period. So, um, yeah. It was Very a cool. big and influential city, and so was Argos, of course, so both of them um, played a crucial role on the Peloponnese during this period. Um, yeah, fantastic. Really interesting, again. And um, in uh, <laughs> at risk of being terribly reductive once again, but do you know what I call Argos? No. <laughs> Pyrrhus's tile shop. <laughs> mm. <laughs> 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 Sorry, that's hard. Yeah, that's, yeah, no. Is that too soon? <laughs> no, no, well, well. Uh, Moscow Flaka is the big Epirus fanboy. And, Only 2,200 so. years ago, so, uh, yeah. Well, 2,300 years ago. Uh, <laughs> I'm, not I'm not concerned by that, I have to say. Like, maybe, um, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe Moscow is, but, um, well, I guess you didn't, you didn't, um, you didn't, um, Compared to the retailer uh, owned by Sainsbury. Yeah, so. yeah. I <laughs> <laughs> was more of an educated breakdown. See, yeah, I only but... thought, I didn't know whether like that would be, Americans would know about that as well, because like, yeah, Argos. And yeah, they used to have yeah. adverts, what was it? They used to have adverts as like, just just go to Argos or shop at Argos or whatever. Yeah. Right? yeah. So, uh, yeah. yeah. If you want to get yeah, your yeah. roof tiles, best place to come. You'll get a really up close view. Um, <laughs> Sorry. It's a lost opportunity. Really, Sorry, really again. Don't sell <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> it's, it's such a lost opportunity. For anyone that doesn't know what we're referencing there, like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You have to go watch my Paris video for that. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Messine, let's, uh, let's move to Messine or Messene. I don't know which way uh, you want to pronounce it, which way the, Greek, the best Greek way to pronounce it. I like to say Messene. Most people like to say Messine. Uh, but yeah, they're down here next to Sparta. Yeah, I think um, I think the second E is long, if I'm not wrong. So it would be something like Messene or something like that. But in any case, most people will know this region because of the um, the Hellas of Sparta. Because obviously in the in the Achaic period, Messenia, Messenia, whatever. I can't settle on, on either pronunciation. <laughs> um, it was um, occupied by the Spartans in two wars, and then the 
um, the population was forced to live as halots, as serfs, as mm. semi-slaves, basically. Um, and there's, of course, the legend of the Kryptea, which we um, decided to believe because we have them as a unit of Spartans. Yeah. An institution for the Spartan Ephibes, so to say. Um, mm. They don't have Ephibes, they have the Kryptea, who had, according to legend, well, Plato, was it Plato, Plutarch, Aristotle, one of them says, they had to live in the wilderness of Messenia for one year and murder at least one Messenian so that they would always live in terror and fear of Spartans. Mm. Yeah, there's the group there. Thanks. Um, yeah, as you can see, I wrote even Spartan teenagers are badly <laughs> threatened. <battle, yeah. laughs> Actually, in the same battle, in, in the Battle of Zelazia in 222 BC, the same battle in which the Megalopolitans fought as uh, Bronx Shield Phalangites. In this battle, the Kryptea is also mentioned by Plutarchs fighting on the side of the Spartans. Mm. Because in this battle, the Megalopolitans, the Achaeans and the Macedonians were fighting against the Spartans. And as you can already tell from the fabulous co coalition lined up against Sparta, Sparta was defeated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, the Messanians often um, try to regain the independence from the Spartans often without success, but yeah. in 371 BC, um, when Megalopolis was founded at the same time, Thebans also made sure that Messina would be independent again, and Sparta was much weakened at this period, so um, it could remain independent, and successive alliances with, with Athens, Macedon, and later Aetolia led to them joining the Aetolian League, actually, 245 BC, along with Elis. Um, to, to protect themselves against the Spartan threat. But of course that didn't help, <laughs> because <laughs> our dear Aetolian friends will remember the story how they betrayed the Acarnanians, and they decided it would be a good idea to plunder the territory of the ally in 222, <laughs> upon which oh, um, they joined the Achaean League uh, <laughs> in the north of the Peloponnese. But 10 years later, they also rued that decision and they went back to the Aetolian League. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> and then, yeah, because that now they had been betrayed again by Achaea's ally, Macedon, um, who was apparently um, the king of Macedon, Philip V, who was under the influence of Demetrius of Pharos uh, from an island near Issa, which we've seen earlier in this video, and yeah. Illyria. Um, so everything is always connected, um, <laughs> but yeah, for the Messanians, it went um, back and forth, and even in in the period under Augustus, in the 30s BC, the Spartans still tried to conquer Messina one last time. Augustus was not pleased, even when the Spartan king, or whatever his exact position was, we do not know, when he offered to, or when he actually renamed his son, to Caesar, uh, to Julius Caesar Augustus, <laughs> Augustus would not forgive him and depose him <laughs> because he wasn't having um, the re-erection of the Helot system in Messenia. Yeah. So basically, that's why the Messenians are there. And I think it's great to see this this rivalry between them and Sparta. I mean, oh, it's more than a rivalry between the Messenians. It's, it's a fight for the existence and it's yeah. good to portray that. Yeah, definitely. They don't have any unique units at the minute, I don't believe. Um, but on the uh, on the Peloponnese, there is a generic AOR unit, which is the Peloponnesian Hoplites as well, or the Hoplites. Uh, but yeah, that story kind of reminds me of uh, the of the Aetolians allying someone and then <laughs> and then plundering it. Just reminds me, which Crusade was it when the Crusaders sacked Byzantium? I can't no, remember. The fourth, the fourth, fourth Crusade. Yeah. yeah, that just reminds me yeah. of that. Just like. We'll go through your lands. Oh, yeah. sorry, we just sacked your greatest city. Oh, oh no. Oh, Whoops. no, we never meant to do that. <laughs> Terrible. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, let's move on to... Let's go south. On to Crete, that is literally Verdansk, or uh, uh, whatever the, the the island map of uh, Call of Duty is called. You can see how long, I, how long ago I played Call of Duty Warzone, but... It is basically Battle Royale Central on Crete right now. Um, so let's start with uh, Kydonia over here. And uh, yeah, they're on the western yeah. edge of the island. Yeah, yeah. I mean, people may recognize Kydonia because it played a starring role in Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Mm. And um, there's also a song about the city by Muse um, in the Knights of Kydonia. Even though they later said it was actually referring to um, a crater, I think on, on on the Mars or in the Moon, which is named <laughs> after the Cretan city. 
<laughs> but in any case, it has gained some fame somehow. Um, yeah, I think I was to say some general things about the Cretans, so it's not getting too long for each of them. Mm. Um, there was basically a lot of inter-Cretan warfare in this period. Even though there was a legend among the Greeks of the mainland that the Cretans would actually band together whenever there was a foreign threat, which is where the word syncretic comes from, because it oh, means cool. the Cretans together. Mm. Um, I actually only learned about this today, so I'm going to continue to use it immediately. <laughs> yeah. um, but as you can see, we have four factions. Kidonia in the west, um, which is yeah. modern Shania, um, one of the most beautiful towns on Crete and often visited by British tourists as well. <laughs> mm. <laughs> you have um, you have um, Gautin, which is the pink faction here, um, further to the east. And the, the city does not exist anymore, but there's an extensive, um, well, there are extensive ruins and a very small modern city nearby. Yeah. Where I had accidents and buckles last year, a kind of Greek with Rusketa. Oh, nice! <laughs> in the back, in the backyard of a Greek temple, which oh, is quite cool. amazing. Um, and then, of course, you have Knossos, which most people would know about because Minos was there. Yeah. The Minotaurus was in the labyrinth, which is why they have the labyrinth as as their symbol. And I think, yeah, that doesn't need much introduction. Yeah. Um, and um, of course, there were other Greek cities on on Crete, like Hieraputna, which is we gave to the Greek city states on the southeastern coast. Um, yeah, that one. And Itanos on the east was controlled by the Ptolemies. Yeah. But um, we have another actual faction here, which is Lyctos, and or Lyctos. Yeah, there's two versions basically, and which has become quite famous in Germany because um, I think is is it Aldi. Um, yeah, Aldi, they are they are selling their products under the Litos brand. Oh, and okay. I think it's also available in the countries. I don't know if you've seen that before. There's a picture where it's in English. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah I look, um, I they have a of Greek Sorry, go on. products under the Litos. <laughs> they have a load of Greek products named Litos. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, are, yeah, are they, yeah, is, this yeah. the, is this their brand as well? Yeah. The pig. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, probably not. Yeah. No, the bo the boar is also from, from the coins of Litos. Yeah, yeah no, yeah. it's cool. I, I love the boar. It's one of my favourite ones. Yeah. Oh, I yeah, it. this, is, this is great. So, we have intense um, warfare on this yeah. on this island in 3rd and 2nd century BC. Especially in 3rd century BC, we have uh, um, various major wars. I think I'll keep it short now and only quickly speak about the Lydian War because um, the Lydians, which we just spoke about, um, they found themselves in a bit of, of a bit of an um, problematic situation towards the end of the century in the 220s, because Knossos and Gortin, the big, the two big neighbors who were usually rivals and hated each other, they had somewhat <laughs> come to, what do you call it, an, um, yeah, an agreement, and now um, found themselves in a in a leak which uh, aimed at destroying Lutos and um, the Lutians who wanted to strike preemptively left their city and while they were away the Knossians found the city no one was there and they burned it down <laughs> and if you go to Heraklion which is which is modern day Knossos basically you yeah. will find the ashes of Lutos <laughs> wow. which archaeologists have actually found from that day in the museum which is quite quite impressive yeah wow. and um, the Knossians and Knossians um, they went on to lose the war, however, um, and the, the ruins of Lutos are perched on a hilltop, which I also saw last year, which, yeah, but unfortunately it was not accessible to the public at the time. Mm. Um, the Lutians, however, they had survived because they had been away. Uh, only their city was physically destroyed. Uh, one of the allies gave them um, asylum, basically, and they later rebuilt the city. And in the meantime, they called for help to an ally on the mainland and the Knossians had um, activated our dear Aetolians as allies, which seemed like a good idea in the first place, but that made the Lutians call on Macedon. <laughs> <laughs> and of course the Macedonians were a bit more powerful than our dear Aetolians and yeah. the troops they sent, including several hundred Lurian mercenaries, Achaean archers, I think, and other troops, they would eventually turn the tide and the Lutians would actually win the war. Knossos was, of course, not happy with his outcome, and the wars would go on between differing alliances, especially between the big three in the middle, Litos, um, yeah. Knossos, and Gortin, but also with um, Kidonia, Hiria Putna, Itanos, 
and the other cities on the island until the Romans would arrive in um, 70 BC and the father of, I think, Mark Antony invaded the island, uh, mm. or tried to invade the island, but while landing his troops, he was um, ambushed by a Cretan fleet and utterly defeated, oh, which wow. was essentially one of the reasons why Mark Antony became such an ambitious man, because everyone in Rome laughed about his father, oh. whose ass was kicked the so-called Cretan pirate <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, however three years later there was a more, much more um, substantial Roman campaign in Crete with over four legions involved and they would eventually conquer the island though there would still be bandits in the mountains and there would still be some yeah. sorts of piracy and all the Cretans would fight on of course but yeah you can see why all these factions are there because they kept fighting each yeah. other and each of the cities has something special to go for them um, yeah. Also yeah, because cool. some of them were aristocracies. aristocracies. Uh, I mean, three of them are. The Lydians are the only democracy, oh, which cool. also makes them a favorite victim for the Knossians and the Gratinians. But yeah, the three in the middle especially, they, they just <laughs> hated each other to the bone. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of like Crete now is kind of like a snapshot of Greece, but just on a smaller scale. It's just big battle yeah, royale yeah. going on between many exactly. different factions. And uh, that's the same that's going to happen on Greece. But just on Crete, it's a smaller scale until someone conquers everything. But if they're going to conquer everything, they still have to kick the Ptolemies off and face the wrath of potentially Alexandria. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's a good, cool little uh, campaign if you want to start as one of these guys. Or if you're going to come to Crete now, like, I'm playing Crete in 0. Uh, I'm invading Crete as the Seleucids in 0.5, uh, but there's just it's just rebel territories. But now, if you come and invade Crete and one of these people's taking it over, it's going to be such a harder task. And on top of that, they're going to have upgraded all the cities, so you're going to get a more advanced, a more wealthy Crete to come to as well. So I think it's really cool uh, that they've all been yeah, absolutely. added in. Absolutely, it, and and I mean, We've already mentioned some of the actors who intervened on the island in this period. Yeah. The Macedonians, the Achaeans, the Aetolians. But so did um, the Spartans, so did um, the Rhodians. <laughs> yeah. And the Ptolemies, of course. Um, yeah. And the Romans later on. Pontos, I think, under Mithridates also had some ambitions here. So lots of powers actually looked for Crete. And it's very much both on the fringes and at the center of the Mediterranean and Greek world. Yeah. Oh, cool. So, in terms of the uh, in terms of the units, uh, the generic units are Cretan archers, Cretan slingers, Cretan hoplites. Caedonia gets their own archers. Uh, Nossos gets quite a few units, to be fair. Gets the Nossian yeah. Nossian Agalai, the archers, hoplites, Hippeis, and uh, Hippeis late reform unit as well. Gortin. Uh, gets the uh, Agalai, Archers, Hoplites, Theroperoi, Hippeus, and late Hippeus again. And Litos gets the Lithian Agalai, the Lithian Archers, and the Lithian Hetairoi. Um, but in terms of the Agalai, what actually are those units? And what does Agalai mean in general? Because I think that's a new one for me. I've not really seen that uh, before on any of the units. Yeah, so um, the Cretans are a bit special <laughs> for all, all the Greeks. The, the Cretan um, is the enemy of Cretan, and the Cretan always lies. We can already read in in Homer, and he gives a bit of a of a quiz of a of um, of a riddle because if the Cretan says that the Cretan lies, but the Cretan always lies, does he lie if he says that he lies? Ah, okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, it's just it's not just, just just this, but also the constitutions, they are the language, they still used la um, letters like the gamma, which looks a bit like an F, mm. um, a letter that had fallen out of use in Greece in the sixth or fifth century BC. But in the third century BC, the Cretans still use it. And they are of other archaic traditions. One of them is their own take on the effects, which we've seen ah, elsewhere, okay. which is to organize the young men into units called herds. In Crete and Greek, it's they are called Agelai, yeah. and um, the whole um, concept behind it is a bit, um, <laughs> bit prehistorical almost. <laughs> so basically, one of the one of the um, ya a young man in his in uh, usually twenty years old, a son of a nobleman, he would ritually ritually abduct 
um, a younger son of um, others, of other Cretan citizens. Um, and then the mates of the younger boy, they would defend him. But all of this is just, just a game. But of course, it could terribly <laughs> go wrong sometimes. Oh Maybe they would God. kill the richer guy, or he would kill some of the poorer boys. That was not the plan, <laughs> but it could still happen. Let us attest that it did happen. But the idea was that he would ritually kidnap the boy, the mates try, his mates try to defend him. He defeats them because he's, of course, richer and the more prestigious person. And then he kidnaps the guy and um, goes into the forest with him, with him and trains him, uh, trains him how to shoot with a bow so they can hunt. And then the mates of the Pora boy, they join them again. And they basically form a hunting and later warrior community for the rest of the life, where the richer um, boy, later man, he has become the leader of the pack, so to say, and <laughs> the others have become his companions, those from the Pora strata of society. Oh my God. So this is basically how the Cretan society is bound together and it's all about hunting and warfare. Yeah. And um, there's a bit of a hilarious, um, t there's two hilarious notes on this because um, I now I have to remember what it was, but I was looking for what Cretans actually hunted. I mean, which animal would they hunt? Yeah. And I think it was rather unusual because you think maybe that um, they would hunt you know, oh, boars. Yeah. Um, but I think it was rather strange. They actually hunted wild goats. Yeah, exactly. They hunted <laughs> goats. <laughs> what the hell? And this is just getting stranger <laughs> and stranger. I'm not gonna. I'm sorry if you're yeah, from Crete, yeah, but yeah. this is this is 2,200 years ago. So don't have a go at me for <laughs> saying that this is slightly slightly weird. But this is just like it's just so different from everything else. It's so interesting. But it, it, it's a wild goat, which is actually not the same as uh, the goats we usually know today. Yeah, They're much yeah. bigger, I think. And they used to live um, there, but um, they still live on Crete, actually, which is the only place in Europe where they still live. Oh, cool. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Um, and you can see them there in the mountains, but other than that, they are extinct in Europe now. Yeah. But um, they still exist in Crete, and there's a cool. plain from the 2nd century BC from the holy island of Delos, um, the, mm. the capital of the Delian League, and the Athenians east of Athens, and... <laughs> um, on Delos, the Cretans who, who visited it, and also Cretan mercenary archers who, who were there, they apparently hunted so many wild goats <laughs> that they were, almost went to extinction on Delos. Oh God. And the gods were not happy. <laughs> <laughs> then, they, then Poseidon yeah. came and gave them a storm on the way home because you hunted too many goats. <laughs> yeah. oh, so I think basically, to sum it up, it's like, um, I think the ancient Cretans they're a bit like, um, I don't know, like a Scottish Highlander to an Englishman mm. from London in the early 20th century or something like that. Yeah. Thought, a representative of, of a lost civilization, basically. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Even for ancient standards. Saul's not going to be happy about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, well, I, I like my, I like Scotland. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I'm joking. It's, it's also cool that they, that, that, um, they, that they, they keep all these old traditions alive. Like yeah. The Greeks early did. And, they yeah. somewhat still do today. You know, they still find a lot of strange things, which even in other parts of Greece don't exist anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's so cool. Do you know what I was thinking about the kidnapping thing? That just sounded so much like Midsummer Night's Dream. I was just like, I wonder, oh yeah. <laughs> I wonder whether Shakespeare, like, I know it's Greek based, but like a lot of the stuff in there, like, it sounds very, very similar to that sort of stuff. So. I wonder whether Shakespeare took a lot of inspiration from Crete for that rather than... Because it's, it's based in Thebes. But, yeah, I'm guessing that he, had, he probably took more inspiration from the stuff you were saying there, to be honest. So, uh, But, yeah, cool. Um, so I think that's yeah. all those units in there. We talked about the Agalai, didn't we? So let's move on to the Black Sea Greeks. We've not got too many more Greeks to go now. We're, we're getting closer and closer towards the end. So... Uh, let's go to the Black Sea Greeks. And I mean, uh, the first one is kind of uh, debatable because they're in the Sea of Marmara as well. But uh, we go with Byzantium over here. And for all you EU4 stands and Bi Byzantium stands, you can uh, you can play Byzantium before it was uh, the Roman Empire for, you know, well, a thousand, <laughs> a long time before it became the Eastern Roman Empire. And, and uh, you know, a couple of thousand, well, 1,500 years or so before it 
died fully. Because um, I know there's a lot of people out there who love a bit of Byzantium. So, uh, yeah, which is a pretty cool little uh, little nation. Three three states, uh, three provinces, should I say, in Thrace and uh, across into... Is that Coachelli? Co Coachelli? I can't remember the name of this Turkish state, but uh, someone, someone let me know in the... Uh, in the comments down below but yeah a couple in thrace one across the water um but yeah how yeah. come they are in the mod then well you already mentioned one important reason <laughs> is um that they are quite well now and people probably like to play as Byzantium whenever um they are allowed to actually play as them <laughs> yeah or play against them as well and um of course their position is very unique Mm -hmm. Polybius, our um, Hellenistic historian, actually praised them for not levying too many taxes and tolls on the goods that passed the Bosporus because they are, of course, in a very peculiar position, even though they are also in a bad position. Because towards the sea, he says, no city in the world is better situated than Byzantium because mm -hmm. they control this trade. They can always um, collect the taxes from that and the tolls, and they would always have money, but towards the land, they're in a quite quite of a bad position also because of the of the old what stations they have and their Thracians yeah. and Galatians to their west the in Tylers, Galatians have also arrived. And either them or the Thracians would always levy taxes and tributes on um, Byzantium, yeah, the Asti for instance, the Bitsia. Yeah. They all threaten them from from, from the land. Um, and this is one of the reasons why Byzantium was one of the members of the so called Nor Northern League which I think we have yeah. to get to now anyway. So basically in, in 280 BC, um, Seleucus the first um, has defeated Nuzimachos and he's the last living Diadoch and he controls everything of Alexander's empire aside from Macedon and Egypt, where Ptolemy, um, now the second, uh, lives. And um, he has defeated Nuzimachos and um, he's now on his way to cross the Strait of the Bosporus into Europe and to reclaim yeah. Macedon and Greece. And then he's murdered by um, Ptolemy Keraunos, exactly. The yeah. lightning who betrays him and kills him and then is killed himself by the Galatians, but that's a different story. <laughs> yeah. um, the point is that upon his death, um, his son Antiochus I ascends to the throne. And Antiochus, of course, is hell-bent on actually recreating the empire of his father. Mm. And now the Greek communities are around the Bosporus and the northern shore of the Black Sea, um, yeah, or northern shore of Asia Minor, they feel like they're threatened by the Seleucid advance and um, set up a league, which is called, well, which we don't actually know what it was called, but it's usually called the Northern League because of its position. Yeah. It was made up of Byzantium, um, it was made up of Byzantium and Chalcedon, which is controlled by Byzantium in the game. Um, it is. It was. It also had its members Chios, which is the green faction, just south of um, Byzantium. No, just south of Byzantium. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Not sorry. I was. Yeah, Chios. Chios. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Chios. Yeah. The kingdom of Bithynia to its east, and then further along the shores of the Black Sea, we'll find Heraclea Pontike, Heraclea on the Black Sea which was a mighty Greek city state in this region. And um, yeah, it also controlled other cities, Teaon and Kieros, who were members of the Northern League themselves, mm. and they were under Heraclion rule. So all these states banded together, and they now had one glorious idea, and we can already see it on the map, how to combat the Seleucids, and it was to invite the Galatians over to Asia, so yeah. that they could fight against the Seleucids. And this is how the Galatians came there in the first place. The Bithynians, the Heracleotes, and the, Byzant the Byzantines actually gave them their weapons as well, and some of the armor. So they may have already have used some Greek equipment from early on. Yeah. And of course, they terrorized Western Asia Minor, which will bring us... Uh, yeah, I just mentioned I had some factions we'll speak about. If you go to the Western coast, to Ionia, now, um, after crossing the Galatians... They, they sacked everything we see in the on the screen right now, basically. <laughs> and if you go down south, there were only two places, one in Lycia, um, but only one Greek city which withstood them because the Ptolemies and the, the Seleucids were also not able to really organize a defense against them at the time. Ephesus and um, uh, Ephesus and Miletos and Pergamon, they would hide behind the big walls. But there was one city which actually 
faced him in battle, which is Priene, and you saw it just there, Priene or the Priene, boys. and they were the only ones. Yeah, they were the only ones who said we will attack the Galatians, <laughs> okay. challenge them to battle, and defeated them. Um, oh. They were the only community who actually won the victory until in 275, Antiochus would actually show up with his elephants and the Galatians would see the elephants and run away. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. And then that would at least relieve Western Asia Minor of the <laughs> more immediate threat. But the Northern League remained a thing until the end of the century. They would mm. intervene on the Black Sea. We will see on the western shores of the Black Sea, we will later see the Pontic Pentapolis, an alliance of five Greek city-states who had the idea to erect um, an Emporion. You remember the name Emporion yeah. from early on? Tormis, now in the north here, modern um, Constanza in Romania. And it was supposed to become the only trade port for the whole Black Sea. But of course, that was not a very positive development for our dear <laughs> Byzantines, because now their monopoly on all the threat between the Mediterranean, uh, the trade between the, the Mediterranean and the Black Sea was under threat. So what they would do was declare war on the Petapolis. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, the Petapolis was supported by the Seleucids, who would start the campaign Thrak and basically eliminate most of the Byzantine. Um, friends and allies that still existed in Thrak. Mm. But at the same time, um, the Byzantines were in the North of the League and they had the support of the Heracleotes and the Chians, the Bithynians. Well, the Bithynians didn't do much in this war, to be fair. <laughs> and the Ptolemies. So the Ptolemy, Byzantine, Heracleot fleet, they defeated the Pentapolis and Byzantium, which retained its position as the trade harbor number one in, in this region. And it, would afterwards continue to thrive economically and then of course also in Roman times when Constantine would eventually take a liking to it and choose it as his new capital. But oh, yeah, cool. the Northern League, um, it shaped the destiny of this region in the 3rd century BC until Nicomedes, I think it was Nicomedes, um, the king, the second, ah, I'm not sure, maybe it was Prusias, one of the Bithynian kings at the end of the 3rd century BC. He was very ambitious and he decided to attack Chios and um, with Macedonian help he overcame the Chians and thus um, yeah, ended the Northern League for good, so to say. Mm. Well, oh, for, cool. From a Bithynian point of view, anyway. Yeah, that's really interesting. So, uh, yeah, pretty cool. I didn't know any of that, so really cool uh, to learn all that sort of stuff. So, uh, yeah, that's pretty pretty sick, really. <laughs> Classic war against war against war against ally. Oh, I'm your ally. No, I'm not again. <laughs> sort of thing that we see all through this period. Um, yeah. But yeah. Uh, the big Seleucids coming in ham as well. But uh, yeah, my favorite nation. So I know I've not said it before. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, Byzantium. Uh, yeah, they have uh, the Byzantine Epibartai. So they've got Marines, uh, but that is their only unique unit at the minute yeah. um, so let's talk a bit about Pontic Pentapolis and I have a little bit of a theory that these guys are actually going to be very strong in game because if we have a look at them they're large town, large town town, large town large town town, large town so they start with a lot of settlements, decent level large town as well, starting the game guys large town is decent level as well Got every single settlement here has a port. Every single one. So they are going yeah. to be rich, rich, rich. And really, when you look at the enemies, there's not many that are too scary nearby. Of course, you've got Tylus, which is you know, not really very scary. Uh, you've got, of course, Kabile over here and the Asti. But uh, these guys are all going to be fighting each other. I think you're pretty in a decent spot. So if you do want to play these, I know they're unplayable uh, in, for this video, but... If you do want to play them, then uh, they're probably going to be a pretty strong nation, to be honest, and a pretty cool one, nonetheless. But uh, I think you have you already explained why they're in the why they're in here then, because they are, you know, on the west coast trying to make all the money, uh, a part of the Northern League, or yeah. is there a bit more to it um, behind these guys? Um, so I think the alliance between the five poles, hence the name Pentapolis. Obviously, Penta's the name mm. five, like Pentagon, for instance. Um, is um, the background is that Lysimachos, the arrival of Seleucus, he um, tried to exert influence over this area and then 
the city-states banded together in an alliance against him and rose up. And afterwards, they retained the alliance for good reason. Mm. And and it was an alliance of five city-states: um, Calatis, um, Mesembria, or Mesembria. Um, then we have uh, the later city Tomis, but it's not a polis yet. We have Apollonia, Pontike, Odessos, mm. and I've uh, forgot one now. But yeah, we've, we have five different polis. All of them were colonies of Heraclea Pontike or Miletos, actually. Oh, which is cool. interesting because the Heracleotes in the Northern League, they would turn against <laughs> yeah. the former colonies instead of supporting <laughs> them, they sided with the Byzantines. So um, They did a so USA before, for, before the USA. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so much for factions for colonies. Yeah, it's a bit like that, but they lost. <laughs> so the Pentapolis lost and <laughs> suffered quite terribly in the second century and first century BC, really, from Dacian and Scythian and Bastani raids and whatever. Yeah. But the Romans, they would restore the Pentapolis and, of course, Ovid, the poet, would be sent there in his exile. Yeah. And speak about the bad weather and all that and the barbarian <laughs> languages he heard there. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you already pointed out they have many cities and that's really one of the main reasons um, we added them. Because they, they they don't just have the five polis, they have I think, yeah, three more settlements. They have couple eight of towns, settlements, I think. Yeah. So DNE. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, exactly. Even though it's called Dionysopolis, it's not a polis. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Achelos Achelos. Is, is only more, it's much more important late into could be. Uh, so um, they control a lot of the land, and that's why they are there. And um, they have, I think, at least one special unit. Yeah, they've got, the so they've got the, yeah, they've got the Epilectoi, which is a reform unit. But they also do yeah, have access really to the um, Thracian noble cav. So that was a question that I had oh. to... Why do they have access to the Thracian noble cav on like pretty much every other Greek nation? I can't think of any other Greek nations that have access to Thracian units, apart from Pontus, maybe. I mean, I can give you this a stupid answer, which is it's, it's, they are in Thrak. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fair. Uh, more, spe more specifically, the the cult of the so-called Thracian horseman was very popular in these cities. So on, on a lot of gravestones and public mm. monuments, we find the Thracian horseman depicted. Yeah, and he is um, he is um, uh, honored as the founding hero of many of the cities, and of course it's 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 a bit of a myth. Yeah, but um, such a reverence for Thracian horsemen may also mean that Thracians lived there. I mean, we know that many Thracians also lived in these cities, of course, because of the ports you've mentioned and because of the wealth that was there and the export of grain and all that. So you could could make good make money there. And, uh, Make good money there, and yeah. um, of course that would attract the Thracians as well. Hence, they could also fight for the Tuppers. Yeah, it's a case of being too successful for uh, for your enemies, basically, isn't it? Oh, you're rich. Yeah. Why don't we go and take that city then? <laughs> yeah, they never had a strong military, but um, yeah. of course you can change it a bit. Yes, but they also do not have access to some quite some units which most Greek factions have. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Cool. So uh, let's move to Histria then. And they are actually kind of spread out. As you can see, they've got these two little regions down here. They've got a town of uh, Orgame, or Gay, Orgame, Istria, uh, Istrianon Limen, and Nikonion. So yeah, they've got quite a few different towns, but they are very spread out. So uh, yeah, um, what's going on with these guys then, with their spread out start? Yeah, so Istros is the, is the Greek name for the Danube, and you can see the delta of the Danube yeah. just there. Hence, um, I think it's not very um, difficult to figure out why they call the city Istros or Istria. <laughs> yeah. Istria, whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, they, they, they were always allies of the Pentapolis, but not members of the Pentapolis. Um, instead, they preserved their autonomy and had their own harbors. The other settlements are basically all emporiae trade ports yeah. i mean istrian on Newman literally means the harbor of the istrians <laughs> yeah okay which is why we gave it to, where we gave it to istros so there was no other evidence evidence but if the settlement is called yeah harbor of istros <laughs> then you may as well give it to istros yeah exactly right um, <laughs> so um yeah it, it's it's an interesting case because it falls under the protection of a getic uh, ruler of the getai um, oh, really? nearby in around 200 BC 
um, and he defends it against another Gatai ruler. And then the Istrians, they raise a select band of archers, which brings us to the unique unit, the Istrian yeah. archers. Um, so their Epilecta were not hoplites, but archers, which is, of course, also a reflection of Gatic and Scythian style of warfare. Yeah. And it, again, like the Phoebes, it made sense. If you, if you just want to defend territory and if you have small fortresses and all that across your territory, then archers are quite yeah. perfect. If you have a tower or a wall, then archers are very, very useful. Yeah. And yeah. That's basically why the Istrians are there. They had a unique position and they have a unique unit. And uh, yeah, there's not too many other options in this area of the map aside from neighboring Olbia, of course, which we would get to. Yeah, that's the next, next. one. So we can uh, we can move straight on to Olbia, which is over here. I believe that's the only settlement they have, right? I can't see any others yeah. on the map. So Olbia across here is actually a large town looking pretty nice. And we've got Anthestirios of Olbia as well. Uh, nice. Got a bit of management. But, yeah. So, they're up here. Just... What's this? Which which river is this? Oh, and well, this one. one of them is, is the Dnieper. This is probably the Dnieper, isn't it? Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. I think that's the Dnieper, I think. The, the Greeks called it Boris Tennis. And um, they, they, the, the, sometimes they also call the city Boris Tennis. But yeah. there may have also been a... Big settlement in the area, and the, the, the Olbians probably destroyed it in the sixth century BC. Oh, cool! I mean, Olbia, like most of the cities in this area, and also all the other ones which come after these, uh, was a colony of Miletos mm. um, in in Aeolia. and um, of course, it, it had some influences from from the Scythians it lived with, and Herodotus visited the place, and he was very impressed by its riches. Um, yeah, it's, it's it's a bit ironic that they only have one settlement, even though they were probably more powerful than the Pentapolis or Istros. <laughs> but um, they have a lot of income and they've got good, good units. Um, yeah. All in Arches, for instance, and um, it was a center of the Orphists. They lived a strictly vegetarian and ascetic life, um, <laughs> honoring Orpheus and Dionysos and... Um, yeah, it was a major place, and it also repelled an invasion by Alexander the Great, who sent Superion, one of his generals, with 30,000 men. Wow. And then in the late 3rd century BC, it also repelled an advance by, well, a people we which are called Galatians, but we don't really know who they are, because we are in modern-day Ukraine here, yeah. so we are coming from. Maybe these are the Bastani, the Germanic tribe, who settled mm. on the western coast of, of uh, the Black Coast. Maybe they are just Galatians from modern day Slovakia or Poland. Yeah. But in any case, again, the Albians preserved their independence and and pushed back their enemies. Um, also, a lot of uh, a lot of money <laughs> was also crucial in this this time. Uh, yeah. But it later became a Scythian protectorate, and then later a Roman protectorate, then a Sumatian protectorate, mm. and finally a protectorate of the Bosporan Empire. Um, yeah. But the ruins are still very famous nowadays and um, visited or used to be visited before the war, at yeah. least, uh, by people, by many tourists and archaeologists. Mm. Oh, cool. Well, yeah, that's that's interesting. Didn't actually know much about Olbia. One thing to note uh, as well, uh, when we were talking about the uh, the Danube River, like these, if you didn't catch the video last week, go and watch it about the map. Uh, but we talked about how this might look different from modern day because it's based on the uh, historical maps of the areas. So, you know, these areas look different to modern day. And it makes sense. These areas are all carved by rivers. So it's not going to stay in the same place. Same thing with the estuary of the Nile. It's different because it's based on historical maps rather than the modern day uh, maps of the areas as well. Uh, but yeah. Uh, so the Olbians have the Olbio Polite archers, the mixed Hellenic archers, which I'm guessing is a Scythian um, Hellenic hybrid archer. Yeah, yeah, kind of. It's exactly based on archaeological evidence um, published by Ukrainian archaeologists recently, and then um, he thankfully suggested a unit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in a magazine, so uh, it was an easy picking for us. <laughs> yeah, uh, good. And then uh, Olbio Polite Hoplites as well. So just just the Olbian yeah. Hoplites, basically. Uh, yeah, but yeah. yeah, Olbio Polite is the name for them, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
And then finally, we have a Chersonesos down in the south of Crimea. Well, west and south of Crimea down here. Really nice color, actually. I do like that color quite a bit. But I, yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, they've got three three sort of uh, towns and large towns, it looks like. We've got Apollonius a the Holy over here as well. Uh, but yeah, one. Oh, it's all, they're all large towns. They're actually going to be relatively rich to start with. Uh, but what were these guys up to then back in the day? <laughs> so uh, as, as everyone who's a ge geography no nerd will have already realized, uh, Khazanizos is not actually Kherson in modern Ukraine, but it's Sevastopol. <laughs> mm. Even though Kherson uh, obviously has the same name, but... yeah. The ancient Greek um, Chersonesos just means uh, something like peninsula, so um, ah, could be anywhere okay. really. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it, it immediately after foundations by um, Heraclea Pontige once again um, set up two emporia, emporia trade harbors, Kalos Liman, which translates as the beautiful harbor, and Kakinitis. And it was a rich trading post out there. And of course, as you can tell from a look at the map, it would struggle. For independence against the Bosporan Empire yeah. to the east. In the 4th century BC, the Bosporans would invade Chersonesos and its territory, but Heraclea, um, its mother city, it would come to Chersonesos' help, so in difference to um, the, its colonies in the Petapolis, it did not let <laughs> Chersonesos down. <laughs> it was so loyal to Chersonesos, actually, that um, after it later joined, I think, with the classes of Pontos or um, did it? I think so at least. Um, yeah, yeah, I think I think it did. Um, he saved it from a Scythian attack, uh, but the city lost Kirkinidis and uh, Carlos Lehman in the late second century BC to, to the Scythians, and then they allied with the Sumatians to defeat the Scythians. Mm -hmm. So a little back and forth, but alliances with Sumatians, with Scythians as well, um, not really any, uh, they didn't really make a great difference there. They always just preserve, preserve their autonomy, but the Nero um, had to save it from the Scythians once again, <laughs> 61 AD. And when Nero saves you, that's usually a bit of a problem. <laughs> and um, <laughs> he left Roman troops there. When Hadrian became emperor, he was not very happy with the solution to have Roman troops up there so far away from the actual yeah. Roman Empire. Um, so he gave it to the Bosporan Empire, who, of course, had been trying to conquer it for half a millennium. <laughs> but <laughs> citizens of Chersonesos were not amused, and under Antoninus, Antoninus Pius, um, the successor of Hadrian, they would regain the independence because Heraclea was still a free city within the Roman Empire at this point. Oh, right. Which uh, is testament to the big importance Heraclea Pontic had. Yeah. And they asked, they petitioned with the emperor to give. Chazanezos back its freedom and he actually restored it. Yeah. Oh, cool. Interesting. So, uh, yeah, I've learned a lot today. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. yeah, that's that's all of the Black Sea ones, well, all of the Black Sea ones-ish done that are not on that are not on Anatolia. So, <laughs> we'll move on to our yeah. final region of the Greeks. And uh, I think we've done pretty well for time, to be honest. Um, yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> But yeah, we've done, we've done it. Uh, oh no, we, we, we do, we do have a few more to do. To Not that many though, but we'll start with uh, the Western Asia Minor Greeks. So the Western Anatolian Greeks, pretty much. Yep. In terms of the generics that we have around here, depending on the regions, uh, over here in Smyrna, there are the Smyrnaean Phoebes. And then, is there an Ionia as well somewhere? Because we've got the Ionian Epibartai. Um, yeah, Ionia is basically the, the southern half of the western coast of Asia Minor, including okay, yeah. Athos and Miletos, the two largest cities. Um, yeah. Possibly the two largest cities in Asia Minor in this period. Yeah. And they're just very close to each other. Yeah, cool. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, so those are the just the generic. Uh, AOR units in the region, but let's first talk about Kios, which is over here, which I actually do really like the emblem of as well. Uh, but yeah, Kios, a little island of Kios, got its own faction. So how come these guys ended up with a faction on this little island? So I, I, I don't really want to, to emphasize the pronunciations too much, but <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> in this case, I guess it's quite important to emphasize that in Greek it would be more like Kios 
because we also have kiosks starting with a kappa, um, which we already saw just south of Byzantium. Yeah. Um, but kiosks, um, it's, it's, a bit, it's a bit of its own diverse world, covering almost 900 square kilometers. And Thucydides called its inhabitants the wealthiest of all Greeks. Mm. And um, it successfully resisted the Athenian attempts, attempt, Athenian attempts to retake it when it rebelled during the Peloponnesian War. And then, under the influence of Mausolos of Caria, yes, indeed, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the um, democracy of Hios was actually overthrown, uh, replaced with an oligarchy in the mid fourth century, mm. and this formed a new league with Rhodes, um, Kos, and Byzantion under the protection of Mausolos, and they quit Athene Stadium League for a second time, and then Hios later um, supported Athens in defending Byzantion against Philip II of Macedon. Yeah, the enemy of the my enemy is my friend. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and then Alexander actually restored democracy in Chios, and it, it remained an economic um, powerhouse because it was the only big place that um, produced um, mustic, and mustic is still um, now called the Tears of Chios sometimes. Okay, and um, the island of Chios remains the largest producer of mustics in the world. And if you don't know what mustic is, it's a bit of, it's it's a, a raisin obtained from the mustic tree. Okay. And the tree is very um, um, common on Chios, but not really elsewhere. Damn, and, they love um, raisins back in the day. Then they love raisins back in that yeah. period. <laughs> they're, like, they're like, this is and, worth um, more than gold, man. This is worth more than gold. Shower me with money. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I mean, it's it's with the resins or whatever. It's it's, <laughs> it's it's added, for instance, to Syrian ice cream and a turkey. It's used nice. in Turkish delight and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, it's quite important stuff. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's very it's very affluent and, um, yeah, it, it it was a Roman ally as well for for a period. And um, in 270 BC, however, it's more or less under the protection of the Ptolemaic Empire. Good relations to yeah. Rhodes, Pergamon, and Byzantium. And it's basically the Eldorado of the Aegean, so... Um, <laughs> mm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> nice. Cool. But they've got, they've not got any unique units. Is there any reason for that? Or is it just because there's no historical evidence that they were particularly good at any sort of uh, battle and, and fighting sort of things? Yeah, well, we actually debated it, but um, kind of like Switzerland, they, they tr tr basically tried to stay neutral most of, most of the time so that, that they were not... Um, get um, to a point where people would raid their valuable yeah. mustic trees. So um, <laughs> they basically stayed out of the fighting and hence we've decided against adding the unit. Yeah. yeah, fair enough. And uh, so on to uh, Praini or Praine or something like that. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> fantastic pronunciation once again. Uh, but yeah, these guys nestled right in between Halicarnassus uh, and Ephesus. Uh, well, when I say Halicarnassus, it's down here, isn't it? But, you know, Ephesus and Halicarnassus, pretty much. In between those two. In between a rock and a hard place, really. Uh, with the Seleucids and the Ptolemies either side of them. So, uh, I think you've already mentioned that these guys were the one nation to actually fight the Galatians and not cower away. Yeah. Um, so, what else yeah. What else were they up to then, back around this period? So, I think the Praenians could become a bit of a favourite to some people for, for the mm. history. History. It's so special in, in many regards, and, and we can connect a few threads of the conversation we already had. Um, yeah. On the one hand, Priene was actually, and Miletos, its arch rival to the south, which is an emergent faction. Um, um, they both suffered from the silting of the rivers in the region. As you can tell here, they're on the, on the bay of Miletos, on um, a river, which I think is the Meandros. Uh, let me check that. But... Um, in any case, um, yeah, they um, the, the silting of the rivers forced the Praenians to relocate their city in the 4th century BC. And they then rebuilt it after a plan of Hippodamos of Miletos, um, the Meandros River, yeah. And um, that kind of made it into a bit of a um, plant-looking city, like Manhattan or something yeah. like that. <laughs> and Meandros, from which the English uh, expression meandering derives, mm. um, that was responsible for this and um, in the new position they actually didn't have much space but and it was never a big city neither before nor after um, 
the moving, but it was one of the most important cities in the Greek world nonetheless, because it was the capital of the Ionian League. The Pan Ionion, the, the sanctuary of all the Ionians was there. It was crucial during the Ionian revolt against the Persians from 499 to 494 BC, and they actually fought together with the Milesians. And Priini um, erected a radical d democracy, which was much more radical than even Athens. And yeah. sometimes uh, used to be cited as, a, as an ancient form of communism, which of, mm. is of course a bit, <laughs> bit <laughs> going a bit too far. But um, yeah, there's evidence, for instance, that some of the richer people, which did exist, and we have a unit representing them, the Hippotrophoi, the horse breeders, which is mm. a heavy cavalry unit mentioned in the fight against the Galatians. Yeah. Um, these guys actually, um, these guys actually, um, sometimes um, in, we have inscriptions of that. They would give banquets and breakfasts for slaves and women, foreigners as well. So everyone mm. would feel the same. And um, they also had very interesting ways to, to educate the youth, which of course was instilled with hatred of the Milesians <laughs> across, <laughs> across the, the bay. And um, they would train, um, well, it's now been shown by a new article that what is meant by the inscription may just be um, different kind of boxing gloves but um in fact the <laughs> greek words one of the words means metal balls and the other ones means um the bulbs of kind of onion which they may have <laughs> fought with <laughs> yeah <laughs> so they were after strange things uh, maybe they were just boxing but yeah. i like to believe that they were up to strange things because Battle. they were kind of an anarcho-communist uh, yeah <laughs> commune in ancient greece Slingers and with they just onions. hate the Milesians. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Living and, and playing with, uh, fighting with onions against yeah. the oligarchs of Miletos, <laughs> which was famously and rich. And Miletos, as we've seen, um, it founded most of the cities around the Black Sea. Mm. And it may have had a plan in the Atai period to actually um, control the Black Sea and create a big empire there. But yeah. um, thanks to Persian advances, even though the Malaysians initially um, were quite successful in pushing back. The Lydians and the Chrysos and then the Persians that were eventually conquered after the Ionian um, revolt. And Herodotus says his inhabitants were deported, but already in 450 BC they paid the annual contribution of 10 talents to Athens' Delian League. <laughs> and a talent, um, that is basically um, for one talent you can afford one warship per year, and this is just a tax that they paid. And just for comparison, the tax the Milesians paid to the uh, Dalian League was more than all the islands of the Aegean combined could pay. Oh my God. <laughs> so it was very, very rich. And yeah. It was a steering type for luxury. And um, the Malaysians also most likely um, invented the first um, genre of pornography <laughs> right. and of porn stories in the second century BC. And of course, they were set in Miletos because it's a place of luxury and rich people. And, <laughs> yeah, it, it was just perfect to sit there. And so basically, <laughs> that porn was a genre that already existed in, in antiquity. And the Romans and Greeks called it Milesian stories. Oh, right. <laughs> so they, it was rampant in Miletos then. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. named after you. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, whatever you prefer, the Milesians or the Prianians, but uh, <laughs> yeah. there's, a, there's a radical opposition between the two. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, there's some fascinating places, really. Yeah, that's cool. That's really cool. So the, so Priene, uh, Priene uh, I can't even, I, I'm just going to not say it. Um, Prainian Ephebes, they have. They have Hoplites, they have Epilectoi, and like we said, the heavy cavalry of the Hippotrophoi as well. Miletos, like we talked about, it's an emergent faction down here. It's got the Milesian Horophilarches, which are a... That's a spear and board unit, if I'm not mistaken. That's just a spear unit. Uh, I think they have, they have javelins as well, at least. Okay. I think they're basically an elite Peltas unit because Horophilarches uh, means the border, the border guards. Okay, and yeah. they were established so that they, again they could defend the territory of, of mm. the polis against yeah. the Persians from the Greenians or whoever. Yeah, cool. So, uh, and then uh, they've got Milesian Hoplites and they've got Milesian Neocretan archers as well. Oh, there's one thing I forgot to ask while we we're on the subject of Neocretans. What is the difference between a Cretan archer and a Neocretan archer? And why do all <laughs> the non Cretans have Neocretans? And I mean, obviously, Neo means new, but. Uh, the Neocretans and then the 
The Cretans. <laughs> so what is the difference between those two and, and why does it exist, I guess? So um, you asked this question at the right point of time because <laughs> um, this is actually a question I cannot answer. <laughs> yeah, <bad. laughs> because um, there's, mu there's much debate about this. But for Miletos, we actually know why they're called Neocretans because they, in, 200, in the 230s BC, after they had become independent from the Ptolemies and then the Seleucids, um, they hired 1,000 Cretan mercenary archers. Cool. And they settled them with their families mm. and they made them. They gave them basically a grant so they would become citizens of Miletos at the end of the time period, 25 years or something like that. Did they and provide... thus they were Cretans to become new citizens of, of Miletos and they would still fight the ranchers. Did they provide enough wild goats for them to hunt or was there, was there grumbling? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, presumably there are enough wild goats in the area, but <laughs> I can't bear for sure. But so in this case, they're actually Cretans. Um, yeah, who become new citizens of Miletos. And then we have Neocretans in the army of the Aetolians, who are from Knossos as um, yeah. a repayment of Aetolian help on um, on Crete. But this is in Aetolia, and we have a lot of other cases like the Ptolemies, the Seleucids. Yeah. There's a lot of discussion, basically, if the Neocretans are um, Cretans, um, if they are actually Cretans or if they're not Cretans, that's the first question. Yeah. But basically, there's two explanations. Either they are Neoi, which is basically, which means the new ones, which is basically another word for Ephebes. Yeah. Or, well, most likely, in most explanations, they are. Either they are your own Ephebes from, say, um, Achaea or the Seleucid Empire, and they're trained by Cretan officers so they can fight like Cretan archers, or yeah. they're actually Cretan Ephebes who go abroad. To, mm. to experience a life as a mercenary before, before going back to Crete as adults, basically. Fair, cool. Interesting. Yeah, very interesting. Um, yeah, I think, obviously, debate's still going on with that. But yeah, nice. Uh, I, I just didn't know. I, I thought it was just like the style of which they fought was like, uh, mm. you know, based on the Cretans, which I guess is partly that as well. Um, but yeah, so let's, uh, let's move north then. Slightly north. Up to Kaizikos, over here. Kaizikos, on the Sea of Marmara. Is that on its own island as well, or is yep. it just a land bridge? Yep. <laughs> cool. So, yeah, right in the Sea of Marmara. Um, and these guys, I think they've only got one settlement. Yeah, one settlement right next to the Seleucids. So, uh, what are these guys? What are these guys about, then? Ikitikos is, um, or well, that's how I pronounce it in my German pronunciation of ancient Greek or whatever. We won't find the right one, <laughs> um, at least not tonight. Um, no. <laughs> Kizikos, or whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah, it was actually on an island, but connected um, to the land with a dam. I think they already built in antiquity. And it was known as a maritime power and still fought alongside the Romans, even I think in the Nisokii War in um during that period they still had their own fleet which would support the romans but um they were actually quite uh well situated and Strabo, the geographer um the geographer of um, the time of augustus he wrote about kizikos that was one of the cities which basically uh, impressed him more than any others he had seen or he had heard about because of his position and it was really uh, wealthy um, like Miletos or uh, Hios and it would, it would, it would rival them. Mm. And um, I would just quote Strabo who says that Kytikos is an island of the Propontis be connected with the mainland by two bridges. And it mm. is not only most excellent the fertility of its soil, but its size has a perimeter of about 500 stadia, which mm. is 90 kilometers roughly or around. Yeah. It has a city of the same name near the bridges themselves, and two harbors that, that can be closed, and more than 200 ship sheds, which um, shows us that they had a big fleet, and that's why they have an Epibata, a Marines unit, of course. Yeah. And they also depicted on a stela, um, a gravestone. And Strabo continues, This city rivals the foremost of the cities of Asia in size, in beauty, and in its excellent administrations of affairs both in peace and war. And its adornment appears, appears to be of a type similar to that of Rhodes and Massalia and ancient Carthage. End of the 
end of the quote, but um, Starbo later adds that, um, but the Romans honored the city and it is free to this day, 24 AD. It holds a large territory, not only that which is ha it has held from ancient times, but also other territory presented to it by the Romans. Mm. Cool. Um, so um, it, it still profited in this period and it, it was officially part of the Persian Empire, but it had its, had its own tyrants and yeah, really like Chios and, um, uh, and, and Miletos, it was an economic powerhouse. And according to Strabo, um, well, this may be a bit off. <laughs> Mithridates, Mithridates <laughs> the sixth of Pontus, led an army of 150,000 men against Kitikos, supported by a huge fleet. But he was utterly defeated <laughs> <laughs> by the Kitskin army and their famous, um, the famous um, fleet and and Epibatai. And the coins would actually become the, the role model for the Parthian coinage because they mm. depicted a per per Persian archer in a Persian period. So Kitikos cool. was a maritime power and an economic powerhouse. Nice. Cool. Well, uh, I, yeah, I kind of doubt that he went with Mithridates went with 150,000 men if he was yeah. defeated at this time. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> More like 15,000, probably. <laughs> they love to embellish the stories, didn't they? It's like uh, when, I was, when I was reading up on Pyrrhus, like uh, I think the Battle of um... <laughs> Heraclea, yeah, Heraclea, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Heraclea. Um, like one source, like Cassius Dio, I think, said that like fifteen thousand died on one side and seventeen thousand died on the other. But then, like one of the other sources is like, yeah, three thousand and five thousand, bro. <laughs> So, yeah, <laughs> which is still a lot, but it's not like the ridiculous numbers that they were just embellishing like with back in the day. Yeah, just like I think there's a there, there's a part in, in in Livy where he speaks about the Roman wars in in Greece and the battle between the Macedonians and 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 the Romans, and he knows that Polybius, who was basically the, he was basically there who lived during the period and yeah. was a key in cavalry during that during the time. He says that I think 5,000 Romans and 10,000 Macedonians were killed in the battle. Mm. And then Livy says, but the Roman historian Fabius Pictor says that 50,000 Macedonians <laughs> and five Romans were killed. And even though Fabius is the great authority on the ancient world, in Gre uh, on the Romans in Greece, I believe Fabius Pictor because Romans are so cool. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Yeah. Classic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Romans are just like, yeah, no one died. 100,000 Gauls died. <laughs> like, exactly. Easy win, yeah. boys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but, yeah. but anyway, uh, <laughs> let's get back to uh, to these guys. The uh, Kizikan Hoplites, the Kizikan Epibarti, and they have uh, Aspido, Aspidophoroi as well, cavalry, which are after the reforms. And right next to them, they have Chios, or Chios, uh, over here, right next to Bithynia, that we talked about being in the Northern League uh, before. Yeah. Uh, these guys have the Kian Archers, uh, and that's about it. But what's the significance of these guys? I see that they've got a. Is that a. Is that a. Qu no, is that. That's not a Quinkareem Hall, is it? Is that a Trireme Hall? Is their logo? Uh -huh. Wow, that, that's a very good question. What kind of what yeah. kind of ship? They got a ship is. as their as their logo anyway. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they are also situated in this area, and of course, um, they also had some maritime um, power. Um, but they are just um, were also depicted, I think, uh, on coins. And yeah, um, yeah Kiers was one of the members of the North League, and that uh, had some in significance as such, um, especially after. Um, Nicomedes, the um, uh, Bithynian king, when he died in the 250s, and he had founded Nicomedia, the capital of Bithynia, and um, selflessly named it after himself. <laughs> um, after that, he um, uh, he left his will saying that his three younger kids, I think it was three kids by maybe. I think it was his second wife as well. Like he had two different mm. wives. He had an older son by his first wife, but after I married his second wife, he started disliking his older son, and he wanted his three younger children <laughs> to um, follow him on the throne. But of course, his older son plotted and tried to kill his half siblings, and then um, Nicomedes um, 
to make sure that his minor children would survive, he would write in his will that the Northern League, that Chios, Byzantium, and Heraclea Pontique, uh, but also the Ptolemies and the Antigonids, that they should all be the guardians of his minor children and Whoa. defend them against his son. But of course, um, as you <laughs> pointed out several times before, the Hellenistic period was a time of betrayal. Yep. That, <laughs> sounds, though, that, um, that genuinely sounds like the most stupid thing to do if you lived at this time. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I'm going to yeah. give I mean, my children to all my enemies, my successors to this land, the people who have the claim. I know, I'll give it to everyone that wants the land. There we are. <laughs> Here you go, guys. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the, the members of the Northern League were, of course, his allies. And okay, yeah, fair enough. Against the Seleucids, but of course, he had also brought the Galatians to um, yeah. Asia Minor, and the Galatians, of course, when they saw some gold coin, they were ready to support his older son, <laughs> <laughs> and they invaded Bithynia, and then there were several attempts by the Byzantines and the Heracleots and probably the Chians to reinstate some of his younger children but eventually his his older son was actually successful in securing the kingship for himself but there was some back and forth for quite some period mm. and um later i think it was prusias in the late third century bc he then made the decision to attack the Chians, who had sided once again um with the ptolemies and um against the antigonids now who now made uh, a common pact with uh, the Bithynians, which was also the anti-Roman alliance in the Mas Second Macedonian-Roman War. And together with the Macedonians, then Prusias actually managed to conquer Chios, hmm. which is, I think, um, yeah. Is it modern Gamlik or is it Kytikos? I can never, I can never tell. In any case, Chios um, remained an important city in the region and uh, had some money in. But uh, as part of the Northern League, uh, probably attained more its most significance. So I'd not say it's, it's it was super important in the ancient world, but 270 BC is the point of time when it had the greatest significance. So yeah. <laughs> um, if, if it wasn't represented in this form, it would never be represented anywhere. And the Philetairos of Chios we see here was probably a um, uh, relative of Philetairos of, uh, of Pagamon. Okay, and cool. uh, while Kytikos later supplied the mother of three kings of Pagamon, um, Chios was also one of the allies of Pagamon and had a special relationship with them and a special status within oh, the cool. kingdom. Fantastic. Well, that covers off the Western Anatolian ones then, and we'll move finally on to our last three nations. Last three nations. We got there eventually. Um, we've, uh, you know, this has been so good, so detailed on every single faction. I've really, really enjoyed it. Uh, I kind of sad to get to the last three nations, but I think we've got at least one big hitter in here anyway. So Northern Asia, uh, Northern, we're going to call them the Northern Asian three factions. So, uh, we'll start with Heraclea Pontica and we've already talked about them quite a bit, but, um, yeah, yeah. Do you want to do you want to expand a little bit on them, or are you happy with what you've uh, what you've said? I I guess expand a little bit on these guys because they seem yeah. very very important from what you were saying before. Yeah, yeah. So Heraclea Pontique. I mean, it's called Pontique because it's on the Pontos, like Senos, the Black Sea, mm. and um, it was one of many Heracleas because it was it was named after Heracles, which was obviously quite yeah. um, popular, <laughs> a quite a popular thing for Greeks to do. Yeah, and. Um, We've already seen that it was one of the instigators of the Northern League, and it also directed them against Pontos at one time. And um, it invaded the Crimea to to, to defend Chersonesos, and it, it inva invaded the Pontic Patapolis to um, uh, re-establish the Byzantine monopoly on the Black Sea trade. So it's fair to say that Heraclea had huge significance, which is probably often overlooked. I think it's one of the most underrated um, mm the rated factions in cities in the Greek world. And have, we have, have a nice, it's a bit of a longer quote, but I think it's worth quoting here, yeah. from Stanley Burstein, one of the most eminent historians of the Hellenistic world, who's now in his well-earned retirement, but still putting out articles from his nice villa in California. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> and he wrote back in 1974, and I quote Stanley Burstein, few of the hundreds of ancient Greek cities were of more than local significance. Heraclea Pontique was one of those few. From the time of her foundation, about 560 BC, 
Until the Roman conquest in 70 BC ended her history as an independent state, Heraclea played a leading role in the political affairs of northern Anatolia and the Black Sea Basin. Moreover, from her foundation until her capture by the Ottoman Sultan Murat I in 1360, in a period of almost 1800 years, Heraclea was an important outpost of Hellenism. Throughout her long history, Heraclea, virtually alone of the Pontic cities, produced a series of intellectuals who made notable contributions to the development of Greek thought. Men such as the philosophers Heraclitus Ponticus and Chameleon and the mathematicians Bruzon and Amiclas. End of the quote. Nice. Yeah, I think that, that already says quite a lot. And in the fourth century, they, they were under several tyrants who annexed most of the coast here and mm. erected a bit of an empire. And um, they lost some of this um, after the death of, of, um, of the ch last tyrant, Dionysius, who was actually a fanboy, if you remember the first part of the video earlier, yeah. uh, of Dionysius of Syracuse, who was very influential in southern Italy. Mm. And because he was also called Dionysius, the tyrant of Heraclea, he bought all the items and like the personal I don't know, the personal pencil, stuff like that, of Dionysius of Syracuse. Oh, right. <laughs> so he, he could emulate him. Proper vampire. And then the Heracle... Yeah, absolutely. And the Heracle was <laughs> the lost some territory in this period, but they reclaimed some of it, and they would still go on and try to reclaim other possessions along the coast, three cities you see at the, at yeah. the northeast here. And um, yeah, even though it was eventually conquered by, by Rome, we've already said that it remained a free city and they um, mm. even managed to, to free Chazonezos from the Bosporans, basically, through their influence in the second century AD. Mm. So uh, it would remain an important city until, yeah, as Spurstein said, basically the 14th century. Wow. But then it was actually captured by, um, uh, by the Ottomans and um, lost a bit in, in, in importance. And I think it's now called Karadeniz Eregli in, in Turkey. Well, Bucha, my church pronunciation. It's not very important anymore. It has 120,000 inhabitants. But for most of uh, at the time of Greek history in Asia, it, it was really important, yeah. Oh, cool. Nice. So uh, in terms of their units, they've got the Heracliote Horophilarches, which we already talked about, the uh, Epibartai, which is the Marines again, the Hoplites, and then they also have the Mariandinian Javelin Men. Oh, yeah. So, whereabouts are those guys going to come from, AOR wise? Is it Heraclea exactly, or is it somewhere else? Is it one of these other settlements? Yeah, they are basically come going to come from Heraclea and also some of the um, adjacent towns, maybe. Yeah. The Mariandinians are basically the the halot of Heraclea, uh, their okay. version. And we have a very disparaging comment of Posidini Posidinius of Apamea, <laughs> who's known as a barbarian friendly uh, philosopher, but was he wasn't very friendly in this case. Okay, <laughs> you know, he was um, the teacher of Cicero, and oh, he right. wrote that the Mar that the Mariandinians they themselves would be too stupid to sustain life themselves so they needed their the, the crafty and clever greeks of heraclea to support their life basically. oh my gosh <laughs> so um, it was good for them that they would be enslaved because that was the only way they could sustain their own lives because otherwise they would just simply be too dumb to survive <laughs> <laughs> oh my god <laughs> oh. <laughs> Classic, classic Greeks. <laughs> yeah. Classic Greeks and Romans. <laughs> oh, well. Uh, well, I guess hopefully they're more decent than that on the battlefield anyway. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like the Hallett units of Sparta, they're not going to be very quick. No, exactly. Add some flavor and get yeah. that bit of history into the game. <laughs> yeah. Right then, let's, uh, let's move further east and let's go to Sinope. Sinope over yep. here, uh, yeah. which is actually a very annoying place to siege down in EU4 if anyone's played EU4, because it's a level <laughs> 3 fort at the start of the game, and playing as the Ottomans, it is incredibly annoying. Uh, but yeah, no, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's in this game as well, though, and uh, it's a single city up here. Surrounded by Pontus and rebel settlements, so you do have a bit of rebel expansion to do if you want to. Uh, and of course, Pontus behind as well. 
but yeah, just a single city on the coast. Looks like they're trading a lot, though. Um, so what was the significance of Sino up here? Um, so um, if you've paid attention so far in the video, you will not be surprised to hear that Sinope was a Malaysian colony. Because mm. who else would own a colony there? Um, <laughs> in the 6th century, or 7, or oh, I think already in the 8th or 7th century BC. And yes, it had a lot of trade connections, a lot of bases, pottery from all over the Greek world was found there. And um, of course, it also had friendly relations with the North of League. And it would later become um, what quite well known as the capital of Pontos. But yeah. 270 BC, it is not yet under Pontic rule and they would it would take two wars for the Pontics to to actually conquer it and um, the Rhodians would help uh, support Sinope which is why they are allied with Rhodes at the start of the RIS campaign mm. and yeah that has a big significance as a trade city and they yeah, I do wonder in EU4 who controls Sinope is it the Empire of Trebizond uh no it's its own nation I think all oh, right, so yeah, I think the Emirate Trebizond is actually already gone. Yeah, that I... just would have been a uh... nice uh, connect with our last faction, which is actually Trebizond or Trapezuntis. The Greeks might... called it. <laughs> yeah. it I can't rem I can't quite remember. You know, I haven't played Air E4 for a little while, but I just I, it's just a really annoying settlement. That's the only notable thing in my mind about about it because it's just such an annoying settlement to take in early game because it's a level three fort and it's on the coast. Um, so yeah, it's just an annoying little settlement to take early game when you don't have cannons. But yeah, yeah, I think the Empire of Trebizond may already be history at that point. Uh, I think Trebizond, in case, Trebizond is, is in the game, but I'm I can't remember, I don't know whether I think it's just called Sinope, but I I'm, uh, yeah, it might be called Trebizond and then the city the 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 the, uh, the province is called Sinope, but I can't I can't remember honestly to be fair. So. Yeah, I mean, Trapezius, anyway, that will be our last, last faction. Yeah. So these guys <laughs> have... Apparently it existed until 1461, so, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, sh it, it did control Zinope at some point, and it also controlled Heraclea, funnily enough, and Chesonesus. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah, fair. so, yeah, these guys have got uh, archers... So when I'm saying the generic names of these guys, just just remember that it's Sinopian archers, Sinopian Epibartai, Sinopian Hoplites. Probably should have said that earlier, but not right at the end of the video. But yeah, they've got their own archers, Epibartai and Hoplites. And uh, finally, yeah, Trapezus, right over here, coming up into Georgia and the Caucasus, really. Um, yeah. So yeah, right on the eastern edge of Turkey, uh, we've got Timesithios. That's a name uh, of Trapezus yeah. up here. Uh, and I'm assuming these guys were another big trading uh, trading city. And I'm assuming, if, I, if I've got this right, that it was they were formed by Militos. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's correct. We know that it is possible that um, it was basically set up by the Xenopians after uh, its foundation. But basically, mm. that was Milesians who founded Xenopia and then a few years later they went to, yeah. to Trapezius. Mm. Nice. Yeah, it's a bit of a Greek outpost in in, Barbar in the Barbaricum, as you can see. Mm. It had a good harbor. It exported wood. But um, the mountains here go very close to the coast. In Roman times, there was actually only one four in the region of Trapezius. Yeah. Um, with two cohorts of auxiliary troops because that was all you needed to defend the coastal stretch of land because there was just no way through <laughs> wow, because of the mountains. Yeah, You basically had to go all the way to Amizos, which was um, the first... Oh, uh, is it Amizos? Or I always mixed them up the other one. Um, Amas, they are. Yeah, the, 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 the two first major cities of Pontos, or the oh, Ponte right, Kingdom, yeah. a bit to Sorry. the west. Maybe to the west, yeah, yeah, Amazing yeah, Amazing there, yeah, yeah. yeah. You basically had to go all the way there to access um, the, <laughs> the, the roads to the south, which is a bit crazy, but um, yeah, Trapezius profited from this situation, but of course, other Greeks and then also the Romans they kind of thought that it was a bit barbaric, and um, apparently, <laughs> its inscriptions they're not quite correct, they have wrong Greek words, oh, a right. bit cut off from the rest of the Greek word, of course. Yeah. Well, but it's still considered an important part of the world. Mm. When the 10,000 mercenaries fought for Cyrus the Younger, the Persian pretender around 400 BC, um, whose uh, march 
the down to the Black Sea, the Anabasis, um, is told by Xenophon, who was on this march. Uh, when they reach Tapetus, then that is when they are relieved and they know they've survived the march through the Persian Empire. Yeah. And the Greeks see the Black Sea behind the tree, behind the um, tree line of the mountains. They see the blue or uh, the wine rat, as they would say, of the mm. Black Sea. And it would say, Talata, Talata, the sea, the sea. Oh, <laughs> and cool. go to Trapezius and know that that they had survived, even though then again, afterwards, they had the idea to, to lend their capacities as mercenaries to Thracians and other powers. So a lot of them would still die. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, it was still, it, it marks a watershed, basically, between the Barbaricum and the Greek world, most yeah. of the ancient Greeks. And of course, it's a bit mixed. It's a bit like, I don't know, uh, like a station on the outskirts of the known universe, the Deep Space yeah. Nine or something like that. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. Right uh, on the edge of the Greek world, the far edge. Exactly. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So these guys don't have any special units. Is that just basically because there's, the, again, they're on the edge. They didn't, they didn't really uh, commit to, to much fighting and they're, they're isolated, like you say. Yeah, yeah, we don't actually know too much about about them and the military. We didn't really find much, truth be told. And um, yeah, we will eventually add, of course, Colchian units because Colchis is the region just to the east um, where Jason and the Argonauts went to recover the Golden Fleece. Uh, modern day Georgia, or the coast of modern day Georgia, the Egeria, the Caucasian Iberia. Um, so yeah, this is this is this is a bit of a mythical land for the Greeks, yeah. and uh, um, they, they they will have Colchian AOR troops eventually when we get them. And up there, you can see Dioscurios, which is even further off, which is uh, owned by the Greek city states, yeah. and it's mainly known archaeology archaeologically, but stuff from Miletos and Heraclea Pontike, from Athens, from Zenopa, from Trapetus was found there. So um, presumably. A Greek city called the Oscurias can be located there, and that then is the uh, end of the Greek universe. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fair play. Um, so that brings us finally on to the final thing then, which is just the Greek city-states in general. We've seen them dotted around the map. I'm actually going to jump onto the, the, the bigger map and just try and highlight them. Uh, but why did you guys decide to bring those guys in rather than just leave them as rebels? I think, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, I mean, quite a while ago now, but um, yeah, um, one of the main reasons was that um, the, the slave, the rebels, they they like to combine their armies, so we tried to split them up, unless there was an actual alliance attested between these states. Um, so we often have one Greek city as slave and the other as GCS. So um, uh, okay, if you can yeah. fight against the general, you can try and manipulate them. But if you yeah. go to Epirus, for instance, or Illyria, if you go to the coast of southern Illyria, yeah. you will see there that we have two next to each other, Apollonia, I think, and Epidamnos. Yeah. Um, because they were allied, um, yeah, uh, yeah, they are. Epidamnos and um, Apollonia because they were allies and we know they were allies. Both of them are owned by the GCS and the same is the case in Acadia because all three cities there were actually part of um, the Shremony Day and League the Athenians led yeah. against Macedon at the, in this period. So they are all owned by the GCS and they also allied with Sparta because Sparta was part of the of the Charamididae League together with the Athenians and the Ptolemies and mm. the Achaeans. And I think also some of the, I think the Gortinians or Lithians, but of course, in gameplay, that's not going to do much. I mean, sometimes yeah. they actually go and siege and siege some of the, the, the Aegean islands, but it's unlikely that the Cretan AIs will invade uh, <laughs> Macedon in the first 15 turns of a campaign. Yeah. Um, but yeah. If you play a Cretan faction, then you can, of course, role play and help your allies in Greece against yeah. um, against the Macedonians. And yes, the the, Knos the Nossians, the Lutians, and um, the Gortinians, they are all attested for mm. to actually sending troops to Greece itself. Yeah. yeah. So it's basically just to you know, sort of have an actual faction there rather than just rebels. That rebels are very passive; they don't do that much. So an actual faction will go out and fight and try and take land attack its uh, neighbors and obviously with rebels they don't really upgrade cities 
So with faction there, yeah. you're going to be able, if you take one of their cities, it's not just going to be a bog standard town after 100 turns. It'll actually be upgraded, which is a lot better than taking, like, you know, taking a town after 100 turns and it's still just a town. Uh, but yeah, it's just more battle royale and, and all that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, really cool. Well, I think, I think we've, I think we've made it. I think we've got to the end. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for that, Malzoff. That was honestly so interesting. Uh, really in depth on all those factions. And I think everyone can really appreciate the amount of historical knowledge and reasoning that's gone into all these factions and everything that's in the mod as well. Yeah, thank you for having me. And thank you guys for watching. And guys and girls, I should say, and everyone. Um, we hope you enjoyed the video, and there will be more RAS content in the coming weeks on Red Z's channel. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I can tell you that. And uh, we are building towards the, the next release, of course, of our IS 0 0.6. And as you can see, um, we've made great progress with the factions, the units, and the map, which is at this moment being completely finished. So. Um, there's going to be so much new stuff you won't believe it <laughs> yeah it's gonna be it's gonna be awesome so stay tuned guys make sure you do subscribe make sure you do like this video if you've appreciated uh, appreciated it because there might be another couple of videos coming with miles loss uh, in the future as well so uh keep that in mind um and make sure you check out the greek aor units and the uh, and the map showcase if you've not seen the map showcase as well and stay tuned because as i've said already Every weekend, guys, is going to be an in-depth uh, development update on version 0.6 all the way to release. So every weekend, you're going to be full of RAS content just like this. So thank you very much for watching, guys. Thanks once again to the mod team, especially um, Mausolos. So thank you very much uh, for watching, guys. And I will see you all again on the next video. Bye-bye.